You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. and about three hours from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles. And thanks to Commonwealth Classics for the continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, podcast number 89 for August 2020. This is the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by Ford About. Land Rover owners, if this is your first time coming to the show, welcome. I hope you enjoy listening. I am your host, John Costage, and joining me via Zoom, Harold Morgan Dixon, and our newest contributor is Brian Joslin. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Dixon is once again overlooking his forward controls as he has that background image. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sky creeper. All that are denied to me. Those darn, darn borders. Brian is also our guest this month. He's going to tell us about the end of production of Alloy and Grit. I will. Tear, tear comes to our eye. Sorry about that, Brian. But, end, uh, end of an icon. Thank you. Uh, as always, thanks for your comments, follows, likes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. And the podcast, uh, as you may know, is all now available on YouTube. It's uh, Center Steer Podcast is the account. And no matter how you primarily listen to the show, feel free to subscribe to it on all those channels. <laughs> doesn't do any harm it may have the podcast rise for others to view it or listen to it and you can also ask alexa to play the center steer podcast i think it works for most people because i set up a shortcut but they don't call it a shortcut it's called something else I, so i actually set it up and i had some people test it and it seems like half the time it worked half the time it didn't so you may be able to say hey alexa play the center steer podcast and i hope i just triggered your alexa listeners <laughs> <laughs> while you're listening to the podcast and all of a sudden the podcast starts playing. We could, we could sit there and keep saying that every five minutes and get into a nifty loop. If you have been following Oxford in America, enjoying our interviews with figures in the Overland and Land Rover community, and you're liking our coverage of most things Land Rover, please consider supporting the show. You can be a regular podcast supporter through Patreon. You can be a one-time supporter through Buy Me a Tea, or you can show off your support by purchasing a t-shirt or sticker. Still have plenty of shirts and stickers. Visit our website, centersteer.com, for all the details there's links on the page we've also added a voicemail feature to the website you can record your comment or question enter your name and email and send it over to us most likely we will include the audio on the podcast there's a big red button called send voicemail on the website i actually got a message from uh, dave short just wanted to send me a voicemail for the next three voicemails we get they're like legit not dave giving leaving me a, a message we'll also give you a shirt coming up after the news also will be david short giving us a update on oxford in America. So stay tuned for that as he tells us about his journey eastward. <laughs> He's going to have a great time. Let's, let's hope he doesn't encounter any, any coyotes with anvils. All right, in the news, Jaguar Land Rover parent Tata posts bigger quarterly loss on pandemic hit. So Tata Motors suffered a substantial quarterly loss as key in as sales in key markets tumbled as a result of the coronavirus. Uh, JLR owner had been trying to turn around the British business, but the crisis made that task much more difficult. JLR accounts for most of the Indian giant's revenue, but they fell by more than 42% during the last quarter. For fiscal year 21, JLR will continue to manage costs and investment spending rigorously, Tata said in a statement. And this other article gave some breakdown. JLR said the UK market was particularly impacted with industry down 70% for the quarter. JLR sales were down 69.5% specifically. Sales are said to have improved month by month within the quarter across all regions as economies reopen, with June retail sales down 25% with recovery in China and North America particularly in Encouraging. Sales in China declined 2.5% for the three-month period, while North America, they were up 2.2% year-on-year for the month of June. It has led to some more of the usual denials um, from Tata that they're going to flog JLR. I saw another denial about two weeks ago saying, nope, we're not planning on trying to sell any part of the corporation. Yeah, Tata has denied reports of plans to sell its stake in JLR after a breakdown in talks with the UK government to secure a financial rescue package, emergency funding talks with the UK's biggest car maker, and Tata Steel, which runs 
the largest steel works in Wales, both owned by Tata Group, recently ended with the UK government deciding both companies needed to rely on private financing to survive. Following the conclusion of the talks, which ended after the Treasury deemed the Tata Group had the financial strength to not need a taxpayer bailout, reports emerged that it might sell its stake in the struggling car maker. Tata said, quote, unconfirmed and unsubstantiated reports have been published by some media alleging that Tata Motors may sell its stake in JLR. Tata Motors categorically denies and dismisses any such intent. JLR is and remains a key pillar of Tata Motors and the wider Tata group, unquote. You know, it'd be a slow month if there wasn't a denial like that. <laughs> I thought it was interesting to learn that they are a good, that JLR is a good part of their business. I thought it was like 20% or something, but I... I didn't see the percentage here, but I th- it sounds like they're making it out to be bigger than I originally had, anticip- had thought it was. I didn't see the actual number of the business, though. It seems to me yeah, they, I, they need some marketing collateral of some sort with, uh, you know, the corporate logo and JLR. We're still not for sale. <laughs> they did get one large loan, which is completely unsecured, but um, I'm not sure what they're going to use that for. I think that was with the Chinese bank, was it not? Yes, it was. Yes, you're right, Chinese. Probably secured it with their the half interest they have in the Cherry JLR venture. That is possible. JLR names ousted Renault Boss as new CEO. JLR has picked Renault Boss Thierry Bollard. Does anybody know how to say it? Am I saying that right? Theory. Is it, is it TH? Well, someone please yeah. help me. It'd be, like, it'd be like Terry, basically. Yeah. Okay. Terry. Terry Bellar, I suppose, as its, as its next chief executive with a mission to return Britain's car, uh, biggest car maker to profit. A Bellar took over at Renault in January 2019 after the fall of Carlos Goshen. But was, uh, but was always viewed as close to the French car maker's longtime boss and was pushed out in October when the company was looking for a fresh start. Buller will take over on September 10th, replacing Ralph Spaeth, uh, whose tenure ends after more than 10 years. Bollard takes over a business that has built over 500,000 cars in 2019-2020. He faced a number of tasks, including how to handle J- the Jaguar brand, which underperforms Land Rover Mark, how quickly to electrify its lineup, and a potential hit from Brexit if trade barriers are imposed. JLR has a partnership with BMW on electrification, and parent company Tata Motors recently recommitted to the company. Tata Group recognizes and values JLR's future potential high Highly, said JLR chairman earlier this month, quote, that is why this company is central to our business automotive presence for years to come. Was Were there any reasons besides his association with the former Renault boss for his being pushed out or not so clear on that? <laughs> that was that was pretty much all I read. I, I saw one or two articles and that was the one that had seen the most detail. Well, I wish him luck. Absolutely. Good luck. Wasn't there some thinking, too, that Spaeth might stay on or like, please stay? But uh, I guess. Well, no, he had to go because he was 65, right? They have a hard retirement age at 65. And they did bring him back for a short period of time. All right. JLR to move production of the 5 liter V8 in-house. Uh, the automaker revealed this week in a statement to Autocar, the move means JLR isn't about to swap to a V8 source from BMW anytime soon, as has been reported in the past. The swap to a BMW V8 may still happen, according to Autocar's resources, most likely when stricter EU7 emissions regulations are introduced in the European Union. That's due to happen around 2026. JLR's 5-liter V8, codename the AJ, is currently built on an independent line at a Ford engine plant in Bridge End, United Kingdom. The contract with Ford ends this year as the Bridge End plant is being shuttered, so JLR will move the production line to its own engine plant in Wolverhampton. The 5 liter V8 is used in multiple JLR products, including the F Type, Range Rovers, and perhaps soon the Defender. It delivers 592 horsepower, 515, 516 pound feet of torque, and the highest state of tune we've seen. And that was in a limited edition J Jaguar XE SV Project 8 launched in 2017. The AJ actually dates back to the mid 90s. It was a, the, one of their first big projects that Jag undertook once they had all that, that money infusion from, from Ford in the early 90s. But yeah, that was really the engine that saved Jag. I think they were headed for disaster with, well, I mean, the, the, X, the XK engine was 40 years old and 
Then there's the V12, which I just really don't want to go into right now. Uh, <laughs> so the, the V8 really, really shook up and, and, and woke up the company in so many good ways. But I mean, it's, the, it's 23 years old. And that explains, I guess, why it's built at the Ford plant still. Well, yeah, it was uh, one of the, the synergies that Ford had, uh, even though it was really a Jag engine and just they built it on a Ford line because they had the capacity. Uh, JLR teaches driverless cars how to reduce motion sickness. They have pioneered some software that will reduce motion sickness by adapting the driving style of future autonomous vehicles to continue to provide our, well, this is a, this was a PR statement, but to continue to provide our customers with most refined and comfortable ride possible. During the first phase of the project, a personalized wellness score was developed, which could reduce the impact of motion sickness by up to 60%. Experts at JLR Specialist Software Engineering Facility in Shannon have implemented the score into self-driving software. So it sounds like they created a baseline of how the car moves and, and they're going to probably use that in the future, which is a smart move. Yeah, the interesting thing will be whether someone figures out how to hack it and, and change the driving profile to make people sick. Yes, yes. Which, <laughs> yes, that will happen. And of course, there's the the old trick of if you're the driver, you don't get the motion sickness. So <laughs> right. another problem with going doing away with the driver. Well, it has to do with the outside world moving at a different pace than your uh, than your brain is perceiving. So if you're if you're the driver and you're paying attention, you know what's happening. But I think if you're a passenger, some people that tends to cause them the motion sickness because the world is moving in a different than their brain inputs are expecting. Yeah, and I was surprised that uh, I think it's as high as seventy percent of people get motion sickness. I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah, I I didn't either. So I I wonder though if that will cause them. Ouch that the autonomous vehicles might just be sealed bubbles with TV screens inside and then they'll show something else besides what's going on in the outside world. I, that's my big worry about autonomous vehicles. There'll be these contained containers that, you know, like an airplane and you won't be able to see outside. Cause yeah, you certainly can't get motion sickness in an airplane. I guess that's true. People have asked people do. I don't know. I just, I don't have, I've not had that problem. Motion sickness problem. Hmm, interesting. I've actually gotten motion sickness in an IMAX theater sitting still. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's true. I thought, yeah, because again, brain input, the input to your brain versus what you're expecting. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah I think, you know, what, what you're seeing kind of needs to match with where your butt is going. Otherwise, I think there's a, there's a, a disconnect there. Enos wins UK legal challenge to totally not a defender Grenadier SUV. <laughs> I, you probably already heard this. Here's the, the two bullet point highlights. A court dismissed JLR's appeal of the UK intellectual property office's decision that not everyone knows or cares what the original defender looked like. Turns out Land Rover never trademarked the defender shape, which gives Enos the legal window. It needs to bring the new, their new four by four to life. <laughs> Kind of surprising how, you know, Land Rover is so protective of all their uh, intellectual property, but never thought to, to capitalize on that classic silhouette, you know, the, yeah. that iconic shape. Kind of a big whoops on their part. Yeah. And they had, what, seven years to do it or something. <laughs> they had plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that copyright should have expired a few times by now. Right. It's not like they didn't know that it was people were using it because you've seen that silhouette used in many places, many times, even Rovers North used it in part of their advertising. And yeah, even, even certain organizations and podcasts use it in their stickers. It's good for us. It's not copyrighted, right? Yeah. Good for us. <laughs> exactly right. Maybe we should change the headline to this to Land Rover podcast is uh, happy that it doesn't have to get rid of all its stickers. Well, when I, when I read that, I mentioned there's going to be a whole lot of happy T-shirt makers now because they, they won't get chased for the uh, copyright infringement on the on the design. Yeah, but but if they use the letters R, O, V, E, and R, they, they're in trouble. Yeah, but very much. P, D, and upside down A. <laughs> well, <laughs> I saw that on a, it was a Chinese uh, Land Rover toy that had uh, some some misplaced Roman characters. Right. <laughs> of course they were. They were conveniently misplaced. <laughs> yeah. Harold, you like the cards I got for the podcast. Do, you know, that has the Defender shape on it. And I, I got those from, uh, oh, what's the people that make all the business cards? They had them out there. Oh, thought, that's uh, Vistaprint, wasn't Vistaprint. it? Vistaprint, thank you. Yes. Isn't that one uh, of their stock images? That you yes, just it was. It was a file? stock image. I didn't even do anything special. I'm just looking through and like, there's a there's a Defender. Do, done. Like, let's make the card, you know, and I didn't have to do anything. It was just part of the, and I even got the discount and the special deal. Got 
Well, I guess it also means that uh, Rovers Magazine's spotted can can also continue because a lot of people would send in you know defenders and that you might see on on various advertising. So I guess it's good for everybody. But you're right, big whoops on the uh, on JLR's usually really good marketing to uh, <laughs> to miss out on that one. Someone illegal is slipping. Yes, those were wouldn't be the first time they they lost their. Uh their trademark in uh what was it brazil they let it lapse and some dealer kept it and then when they came to re-enter the market it was like well you don't own your name you have to give royalties to this dealership british leyland actually let some of their uh, trademarks lapse in north america back in the uh early 80s but then got them all back again where someone said did you Probably. trademark did you trademark the image of the defender yeah yeah we did it it was all part of a big package well, we did it yeah, yeah it because british leyland is always in charge of all the details well they're a good boogeyman aren't they like lucas you can always you know anything you just want to blame blame it on blame it on british leyland but uh, the difference is that with british leyland you know management mistakes that that actually you know there's a possibility that may have actually happened next story new baby electric jaguar to take on tesla model 3 the Auto Express understands that Bloor, who's the new JLR CEO, will have a bold new plan in front of him that centers around Jaguar coming a fully electrified brand to compete with the likes of Tesla and Polestar. Central to that plan is a compact model designed to take on the Model 3. Castle Bromwich will become the home of the electrified Jaguars with the large J-Pace electric SUV due to be built there alongside a new, as yet unnamed, road-based, road-biased Range Rover. The plan for smaller electrified Jaguars does have support at the board level, with JLR's Director of Engineering Nick Rogers telling us, quote, a small electric Jag would be great. We need to think about that. That's a really cool space that ideally we want to be in, and ideally our customers want us to be in, and it's extremely relevant at this time, unquote. I think that's good for Jag because... <laughs> they really only have anywhere to go but up at this point. And there is a, a, a an article we'll get to in just a minute about talking about the future of the brand, so... I, that's a, that's a good segue maybe to that one. Although before we get to that one, adding to our list of internal combustion engines going away in, in cities and countries, Seoul, South Korea is going to ban gasoline and diesel vehicle registration from 2035. Ooh, registration, meaning, meaning existing ones will no longer be able to be legal? Our, this article was uh, converted from Korean to English, and I didn't... Uh, I didn't go through it in vast detail to notice that, Harold. Because they say registration, you know, that's different from manufacturing. And that, that almost sounds like it's not just new vehicle sales. Like maybe if you've got one, you'll no longer be able to legally operate it. It would be aggressive, but it could also be that if it's registered once, you just were doing. So that's huh. nuance. There's certainly nuances in there. So so maybe maybe they're referring to just new registrations then? I would expect that's a given. Yeah. How they are in grandfathering stuff is a different discussion. Right, sure. And that was only in the city of Seoul, correct, John? That was not all of South Korea. Correct, just Seoul. Yeah. In related news, the city of Seoul has annexed the entire country. <laughs> <laughs> the city limits of Seoul. <laughs> it moved, yes. I did kind of scan the article while you guys were talking. I don't see anything here as to whether there's any grandfathering or if it's you know, registration versus new or renew. Adding, adding it to the list, uh, we are keeping track of that. Uh, That's assuming we get out of 2020 first. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's true. That's kind of an if at this point, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, just to, adding to the list, as I was mentioning, so Seoul is supposed to be 2035, Ireland is supposed to be 2030, Amsterdam 2030, uh, Germany, Hamburg, there wasn't a date that I saw. Nor uh, Norway has a goal of 2025. Uh, German, I think the German government was looking at 2030 itself. India was 2030, although I saw, I think, another article this week that it may just go away. Uh, France is supposed to do it by 2040. Britain's looking at 2040. Scotland by 2032. Kind of sounds like we need a spreadsheet of some sort to keep all this stuff straight. The India article was, it was 2030 and they sort of backed down from that. So now it's going to be about 2025 or 2026 for two-wheeled vehicles. <laughs> okay. So we're all Land Rovers. Yeah, they probably have a lot more two-wheeled vehicles than 
they probably have four wheels, my guess. So here's that larger article I was mentioning that I thought was pretty good. And we've heard from this uh, gentleman before. He is, I'm trying to find his uh, name and info here. This is Dr. Charles Tennant. He is a former chief engineer at Land Rover and has also held senior roles at Tonsa Technologies and the WMG at the University of Warwick. And he talked to Coventry uh, Live. They have their business live segment and they were asking him questions about basically what's it, what could be in store for the future of JLR. And I thought uh, some of these were Interesting, since relevant, and probably listen to a good part of his uh, comments here. So the question is, what is the current situation for JLR and how, is it, and how are its finances? JLR has started the new 2021 fiscal year with a set of COVID-19 savaged results for April to June quarter, which saw a 42% slump in sales and a huge loss of 413 million pounds. JLR is anticipating further losses due to subdued sales growth and the slashing costs and investment to carefully manage cash flow. And I'm afraid that means job losses, delayed and canceled vehicle programs, and possibly closing a factory. The new electric Jaguar XJ Saloon, which is seen as a key vehicle for revitalizing the flagging Jaguar brand, was recently postponed until October 2021. And the much-needed short wheelbase Defender has also been put back. Jaguar's Castle Bromwich factory has yet to reopen. Now with a new CEO, the ex-Renault boss and Frenchman, uh, due to take the helm at JLR next month, I am sure that we can expect a major strategic review and product plan reshuffle as he stamps his authority in the company with liquidity of 4.7 billion pounds, including 2.7 billion pounds in cash and a 1.9 billion undrawn revolving credit facility. The stakes are high. And next question. You have talked in the past about JLR revising its model range. Can you expand on that? And I'll read a good bit of this because it's interesting, I think. Uh, now structural problems remain with a confusing and overlapping range of vehicles built off too many platforms that simply cannibalize sales from each other, a bloated cost base, overcapacity, and poor quality and reliability. To cap it all, the debt-ridden Tata Motors has now become a weak father with its own significant problems in the Indian market, where slumping sales and losses means it is worth nothing without JLR, which may explain why Tata is hanging on to JLR at all costs. I would say the new boss needs to do some serious surgery to get back on track, although JLR have some of the best automotive engineers and facilities working out of their brand new advanced product creation center at Gaydon, along with world-class leading research at the National Automotive Innovation Center at the University of Warwick, which, by the way, he works at. Uh, it's not all good news, as my own SWOT analysis demonstrates. Strengths, strong brand image, foothold in key markets, vehicle styling. Weaknesses, small scale, platform architecture, sales cannibalization. Opportunities, collaboration, quality and reliability, electric vehicles, threats, competition, global sales, slowdown, green legislation, and overcapacity. The real question now is whether JLR has the right product plan in place to produce high profit, high margin, profitable sales in the future, and what annual production levels should it plan for. The 14 current vehicles off five platforms are expensive and not efficient, and I fear major product rationalization based on fewer platforms is desperately required. And then he he also has a, they provide here a list of sales of vehicles individual vehicles, their percent change in sales and whether they're profitable or not. I'm not going to go through them all, but if you wish to see like their, you know, their Range Rover is profitable, the Discovery, full-size Discovery is not, whereas the Disco Sport is profitable. And of the Jaguar models, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> two, two are profitable. Two Jaguar models are profitable. The F-Pace and the I-Pace. SUVs. <laughs> yes, exactly. SUVs. We don't want cars. And the next question they had, what does the company need to do as regards to its model lineup? And I'll boil this down to the, this, I think this one sentence is pretty, pretty answers at all. I would be sorely tempted to eventually drop the I-Pace, the F-Pace, the E-Pace Jaguar SUVs, leaving those market segments to Land Rover, who should focus on SUVs and definitely not succumb to the idea of a more road-oriented car, just leave that job to Jaguar. And then he goes on to say the four-door electric S... XE Saloon could go significantly larger than the current vehicle with a two-door coupe and hatchback added to the range. I guess I didn't highlight the point where he said they that Land Rover should drop the Disco 5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his thought was that there was, you know, lots of models. The Discovery 5 is kind of lost in the range because it's not a Range Rover. It's not the Defender. And people seemingly don't like the styling. And it Well, and the, and the more Range Rovers you make, the, the less the Disco makes any sense. 
Right. And with the new defender, it doesn't make any sense. What's Disco's role now? Yeah, I mean it's it's basically a luxurious non Range Rover. So it's yes. <laughs> it's yeah. a really right. it's a yeah. really it's a really crowded middle ground when you've got Velar Range Rover Sport, which is available as seven passenger, also not not great for the rear passengers, but it is available as seven passenger. Um, and and then the Discovery, you know, all on front engine, rear, uh, you know, uh, longitudinal kind of uh, layouts, not not the front drive layouts uh, like the Evoke and, and Disco Sport. You know, there's just so much uh, competing from within in that space. You know, in that what sixty to ninety thousand dollar price range, you know, where those all fall. You know, your neighbors are going to be more impressed with a Velar or or, or Range Rover Sport than a Discovery if they notice Ooh. the difference. If yeah, true, uh, they'll be more impressed with the Range Rover than the Discovery. Uh, Once they it, discover it's not a Range Rover, yes, they yeah. Win. Defender makes a really tough case for the you know practical family vehicle, um, especially when you can. You can really lux it up to the point of uh, and beyond, you know, well, uh, the, discovery the def- right now. The Defender is at least unique mm-hmm. relative to the Range Rover, whereas the Disco really isn't. Yeah. And and actually, I think the Disco is, is, as you said, is in the middle there and it's close to the Defender, what it can do, what it's capable, how it, how it handles people and cargo. And it, but it's not as luxurious, but it's also close to the Range Rover in being not as luxurious, but still capable and carry stuff and go places. And, and yeah. it's not like there's a huge difference in price range either. They right. all sort of intermeld. And then it's the same reason why General Motors couldn't support both Oldsmobile and Buick. And Pontiac and Chevy. <laughs> well, yeah. The Discovery was always, you know, it was it was a funky design. It was it was asymmetrical and, and a little, little avant-garde. This new one, they took it too close to Mercedes and Audi, I think, which was what they're really wanted to compete with not in a way i don't know it, it doesn't really stand out um i mean they they brought it it doesn't look like either of those but it no longer really looks like a traditional discovery either and yet um, it looks too much like a range rover so there's yeah, no distinction yeah. within the brand and uh, and of course they needed to, to lose that squareness to really make you know a, a stronger case for for defender so it's it's in a tough position right now it should uh you know, that's a, that's a busy part of the marketplace. It should be attracting a lot of people, but it, it kind of doesn't make a statement for itself. I think um, you have to get in it to really appreciate it. And then you've got a lot of options for the same money. Yeah. I didn't realize it was actually not selling as well at this point. I am seeing more of them on the road than I ever have. Uh, they are, they are moving some, and I don't know if that's just through incentives or service loaners that are being sold as CPOs or, or how that works, but uh, I keep seeing them or thinking I'm seeing them. And then I realize it's just a Ford Explorer. Ah, that's all dead. Have you seen the new Explorer doesn't look anything like, uh, like Land Rovers anymore. They finally moved away from that. Well, yeah. But yeah, the, 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 a lot of, a lot of, you know, the, the two or three years old or whatever, there's still a lot of similarities more than there should be. I, I've seen a lot of, Land Rovers on the on the road in the last I, I took a couple of trips in the last week or two and out and about. It turns out they were Velars. It was just interesting. I didn't. I've seen maybe were well, I'll see one Disco Five, which to me is rare to see. I saw a lot of Velars, at least around the Pittsburgh area. That those stand out. Those actually do stand out. I think you notice when you see a Velar for in some profile. Reason, that profile, especially yeah, exactly because that rear sloping you know roof in the in the rear it just. It stands right out. It does. Whereas the, I think the five. Yeah. I think I've seen more fives on Lucky Eight's website than, <laughs> than maybe in person. Uh, you know, good for them for make it a a, a good, capable, and and more uh, hardened off roader. I guess that's one place where uh, where maybe Land Rover could see to to cut and maybe maybe save something. The one the one thing I have noticed though is the people who have them uh, really do seem to love them. You know, once they've made that made that jump, other than apparently a lot of water coming in through windshields. Uh, seems to be a real problem with those. It's a Land Rover. You got to keep the heritage. Wait, 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 yeah. wait, 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 wait a minute. A modern, yes, Defender. Uh, excuse me, a modern Land Rover made vehicle. Something that uh, many people have sorted out, including Land Rover. They now have yeah. a problem with. Yeah, apparently the uh, uh, the weather seal um, shrinks over time, and and um, <laughs> imagine that. Yeah. Water water intrusion at the base of the windshield is a is a very common problem on, on the Discovery 5. Other than that, uh, people have really been happy with them. Followed by cracking of the windscreen? I haven't seen that, but... I that's that's that more a Freelander thing, I guess. But. Yeah, yeah. No, just uh, uh, the rubber ceiling 
seems to, to shrink up and allow uh, a gap somewhere. Hope there's not too much electronic underneath that gap. No, nothing at all. No, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing there. No, there's no <laughs> electronics, nothing. There's no computers in a disco. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, that, so that's the possible future of Land Rover. And if you have thoughts on that, listeners, and uh, want to send us a voicemail, feel free to do so or send us a message. We'll kind of happy to hear what you think of, uh, sh- there we go. There's maybe there's the question. Should Land Rover get rid of that this full size discovery. We'll move on to some car reviews. Uh, this is the 2020 Range Rover Evoque P250 R Dynamic S review. This is out of Australia. Just a couple things to, to bring to your attention. I'm sure this means absolutely nothing to you. Even if you're considering an Evoque, he had read out the full car name, uh, which is the 2020 Range Rover Evoque P250 R Dynamic S. Well, you forgot a couple. Uh, it's true. I apologize. Thank you, Harold. The 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Evoque. There you go. Uh, as, as he said, uh, to continue on, uh, I'm sure this means absolutely nothing to you, even if you're considering an Evoque. The range is highly confusing and a quite difficult to understand unless you've spent hours studying it. So let me care to let me care to explain. There are three petrol engines on offer, and this example features the mid-rung two P. P250 petrol engine. Once you've decided what power plant to opt for, next is the model. There's a choice of regular Evoque or sporty Evoque R Dynamic. This is the latter, the one there in the review. Then there's the variant. With the middle of the range P250 engine choice, you can pick between S and SE levels. Top line HSE is reserved only for the larger P300 engine, so is unavailable at this point. The car is, this car is the entry level S variant. <laughs> that makes it a middle of the range example. My apologies for struggling through that, but I think everybody struggles through the where things are and what to pick. And if you want to read the full review, go ahead out and uh, check uh, our, the website. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. This is entitled 2020 Range Rover Evoque P250R Dynamic S Review. It's a good thing Carnell isn't still around or he'd be talking about, about roving the range of Range Rover offerings. Uh, Land Rover Discovery's Sport Range Rover Evoque sees tons of updates for 2021. And there's two articles here, kind of blend them together. Both Disco Sport and Range Rover Evoque will have not one, but two Qualcomm LTE modems on board. One dedicated solely to over-the-air software updates, while the other contends with music streaming. Spotify is integrated into the Pivi menu and feeding the apps. Additionally, the touchscreen has its own fully independent power source, read battery triggered by opening of the driver's door which means that as soon as you climb into the driver's seat the system is ready to go so make sure you shut your door properly when you get out otherwise that's going to be awake all night and run your battery down oh it'll run its own battery down there are some new apps the most impressive being at least if you're using a land rover for its intended purpose off-roading 4x4i which allows you to monitor wave depth approach and departure angles as well as a traction control system all from the touch screen the base two liter Engine 246 horsepower P250 Ingenium gains a mild hybrid system, which should improve fuel economy and reduce emissions. On the other hand, the 296 horsepower P300 Ingenium 4 is no longer available, though as JLR Canada's director of marketing notes, the P250 was significantly more popular than the powerful P300. Uh, more contentious, perhaps, is the fact that we won't be getting the p 300E plug-in hybrid powertrain already available in Europe, an amalgam of JLR's new uh, 196 horsepower, 1.5 liter turbocharged three-cylinder GDM engine, also not coming to Canada or North America, and an 80 kilowatt electric integrated into the rear axle. The P300E version of both Sport Cutes produces about 305 horsepower, 372 pound-feet of torque. The combination is good for up to 135 kilometers an hour in pure EV mode. And thanks to its 15 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, the Evoke version is good for 66 kilometers of purely electric powered range. Uh, The Disco Sport is at 62 kilometers. And thanks to DC fast charging, it takes about 30 minutes to re-up to full. That was that. That was that. That was the review out of Canada. Included that for you, Dixon. Thank you. (laughs) 135 kmh. That's pretty impressive. It actually does go fast. And then there's the 2021 Land Rover Discovery Sport Black Edition, revealed with nearly 300 horsepower, is available with a four-cylinder Ingenium diesel engine featuring 48-volt mild hybrid technology regenerative braking, 
Replacing the previous non-electrified diesel engines, the new, more efficient mild hybrid diesel unit is available with 162 horsepower, 280 pound-feet of torque, or 197 horsepower, 317 pound-feet of torque, and has a fuel economy rating of 44.7 miles per gallon. Paired with an automatic 8-speed transmission, this enables the 197 horsepower Disco Sport to accelerate to 62 miles per hour in 8.6 seconds. And then here's the here's the thing that gets us. U.S. engine options haven't been confirmed yet. Of course not. We're not getting. We're not going to get the diesel hybrid. Yeah. No. Not confirmed. In other words, no you, you, get for us. Uh, you knew we weren't going to get it as soon as you figured out it was actually cool. Uh, new Defender news. There is out of New Zealand a video review of the Defender 110. I'll let you go, dear listeners, and see the video for yourself. I include it because we now have listeners in New Zealand and want to make them feel welcome and encouraged. To... Then Top Gear Philippines. Which I think is still the thing. Any idea what the, what's up with that, Brian? Is it just a no? What, no, I, have no I, idea. <laughs> I think we've talked about this before. No one knows why is Top Gear Philippines a thing. They're still Top Gear, but eight things they've learned about the Land Rover Defender after a, a 480 kilometer drive. I'll just read some of the headlines. Obviously, it's good at carrying stuff. Uh, you'll need a fairly agile dog. So you, you, thankfully, the rear end you know will lower down so you can help to get your dog in there. It's an only good off road. Uh, I will read this uh, comment, not a criticism, but just be prepared for your mates to be less impressed by your gnarly in the bush driving prowess and more odd by how easily the Defender just adapts to its surroundings and gets on with life. Uh, even if you override the automatic terrain response and lie to the car, twisting the dial to tell the computer it's transversing sandy dunes or snow capped peaks instead of a muddy farmyard reddit track, the diffs and the drivetrain simply crack on undeterred. It's even comfortable, much, it's even comfortable, much less side to side head toss than there was when the going got tough in the old Defender. And actually that was just starting it up. <laughs> Thanks. The door mirrors are ambitiously aerodynamic. I'm going to read about these. The door mirrors stick out like a scarecrow's arm and look about as wind tunnel honed as a garden gate. But look closely and you'll see there are small strakes molded into the stem to seemingly massage airflow around the casing. Impressively, the Defender doesn't suffer unduly from wind noise buffeting the cabin at highway speeds. So they must be doing the bit. They must, they most, oh, there's a typo. They must be doing the business, but they're not the best mirror related party trick in the Defender. Oh no. The rear rear view camera is very clever. And we've talked about that before the clear sight camera uh, and how you can don't worry about what's inside the cabin. Cause it uh, is an external camera mount. Be prepared to be judged by old defenders. Of course you already knew that. So there you go. There's uh, top gear Philippines, Kind of some interesting things about the new Defender. Some you already knew. I didn't know about the mirrors. I thought that was mirrors was interesting. Uh, on the arm that connects the mirror to the body, there are these little. It looks like uh, things that pop up lines, like you would see on a on a wing Just of an ridges, airplane. Yeah, yeah, little ridges. In the racing world, that's called a wicker. So does it force the air to to go straight back? Then is that the idea? Uh, and not create it, an eddy. It's actually designed, yeah, it's it's to break up turbulence, disrupt the disruption, if you will, in an attempt to get the air to reattach. The Land Rover Defender 90 short wheelbase delayed until 2021. Now, this is out of Australia, but it applies to the world. Now, you'll see why in a second. Australian buyers will be forced to wait until next year for the 90 short wheelbase with delays also cited for the local introduction of an all-diesel powered Defenders. JLR, or Land Rover, has said that the D90 has been pushed back due to delays caused by COVID-19-related complications in the company's new protection, facil protection facility in Nitra, Slovakia. Defender Online Build Configurator says, due to impact of the coronavirus pandemic, Defender 90 production has been delayed. We anticipate 90 will be available on order from early September 2020. Current prices are indicative only. Defender 110 is available to order and collect safely now. Land Rover USA's Defender Configurator has a similar message but with less detail. A September 2020 order date points towards a 2021 arrival for the Defender 90 in the States instead of late 2020 date originally planned. I guess further confirmation that the 90 has been delayed. And there is a looks like an outfitter in the UK called Powerful UK Limited. Well, in this video, we take a look at the genuine Land Rover Defender accessory undershield. This replaces the plastic toe eye with a thick aluminum skid plate under tray on the front bumper of the new Land Rover Defender. And the Land Rover part number for this item is listed there. Uh, so it's about 25 minutes and they show you taking the, the front off and reattaching the new aluminum skid plate under tray, which is pretty cool. So if you want to see that. 
check out that video. I'll link to it in show notes. Yeah, it's an interesting look at the front end assembly of the Defender and and how beefy it is, honestly. And the Land Rover Defender V8 heard for the first time at Nuremberg Ring. So audio suggests test mules are using the familiar JLR supercharged V8 AJ power plant, which we talked about earlier, rather than a turbocharged BMW V8. However, production of the uh, AJ will come to an end, as we talked before uh, later this year. Although the use of the 4.4 liter V8 has yet to be officially confirmed J- JLR, Autocar understands that it's merely a formality. It's plausible that the 5 liter engine is being used primarily to test Defender's dynamic responses with the weight and power increases. Autocar understands the V8 to Defender is intended as a low volume special variant rather than a series production mainstay. Land Rover may well be stocking the Ford built V8 for use in Defender because emissions targets are much less of a priority for low volume specials. Interestingly, sources tell us that JLR Special Vehicle Operations Division isn't directly involved with the Defender V8 project. Instead, it's an offshoot of the existing Defender engineering operation. Track testing suggests that the extensive chassis retuning is required to ensure the Defender can handle the additional power. They didn't anticipate that before when they were <laughs> developing it. I that shouldn't not. be a problem, yeah. I wonder if will that increase its towing capacity? Uh, theoretically, but it's you know towing capacity is not just about accelerating; it's about not breaking right. transmissions, not breaking drive lines, and being able to stop that weight. And it already it has a pretty high towing capacity. It does. It's 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 like double like everybody else's uh, the its competitors. Well, yeah. Yeah. Best in class is always a good thing. Speaking of which, it's competitors. There's a Bloomberg article comparing the Jeep Wrangler, the Ford Bronco, and the Land Rover Defender. I'm not going to read it through, read it for you. You can go ahead and check it out if you like, but it is a good comparison between the three models. Okay, I'll read you the introduction, the introductory paragraph. Maybe that's important. Talk about timing. Decades after their inception, and while their vintage versions continue to fetch triple digits at auction, the Ford Bronco, Land Rover Defender have returned. All the while, arch rival Jeep produced is 200,000 Wranglers every year and counting. Any of the three rigs can hold its own crawling through the rocks and mud in the real world, but there can be a big gap among them in cost. The two-door Wrangler and Broncos can start around $29,000. The two-door Defender, more like $65,000. I'll let you read the rest of the the article if you want a comparison between the two of them. And they were actually comparing using the D90, which hasn't you know, it wasn't available here in the U.S. either. But is a D90 actually supposed to be more than the 110? Yes. It comes standard with the six-cylinder engine for one thing. So it starts at a higher uh, mechanical spec to begin with. And yeah, a $29,000 Wrangler is not a, a very well-equipped Jeep by any stretch. Right. You're looking yeah. at, at yeah, base model there. Yeah. But yeah, they used the 90 in an attempt to be apples to apples, meaning two-door, Two. short wheelbase. Yeah. And that's where the similarities pretty much come to an end yeah yeah they're really not even all that similar because the 90s i think a a bigger truck than either of those right and upcoming new models the new discovery which i don't know if it'll be a disco six or if it's just an up rated version of the disco five but it's uh, it's due for a facelift so it's it's probably just a a mid-cycle refresh so still still considered a five yeah, yeah. From Car Buzz here. Yeah, the Discovery is due for refresh, having been on sale since 2017. We got our first look at the new Disco facelift back in June. There we go. Thanks for confirming that, Brian. Uh, so they got a look inside the cabin. In contrast to the current model's 10 inch display, the updated Disco prototype is fitted with a larger infotainment display. The steering wheel also feels to have been redesigned. As for the exterior, the prototype is still covered in camouflage, disguising the front and rear fascias. So expect the front and rear bumpers to get some design tweaks. There's some pictures if you want to check out those, but it's uh they only camoed everything below the the belt line from the windows down. I guess it's I guess it is a mid cycle refresh. Did they uh, copyright that that silhouette? They're not worried about anyone copying that one. <laughs> but th- it does look a little bit like a Velar, doesn't it? The silhouette does. It starts to squat down in the back. Yeah, I think they'd have a hard hard time trying to trademark any of their silhouettes now because they have enough problems within their own company of them all looking alike. So. The new Range Rover spied being tested with a roll cage. 
this is not our first sighting of the next generation Range Rover, but it's the first time we see how the luxury SUV testing with a roll cage. This is a bit surprising to us, especially considering the fact that this prototype doesn't seem to be from the more powerful versions of the model. If you take a closer look at the back, this test car has dual exhaust layout as opposed to one of the previous prototypes quad exhaust arrangement, suggesting that this is not the V8 powered model. Still, there's a visible roll cage of some sort inside the cabin suggests the driver, test drivers are probably evaluating the overall structure of the machine. Yeah, the question is, are they evaluating the, the roll cage as a production item, or is that just because it's a mule and they're beating the piss out of it? Probably it's a mule, Harold. Uh, the new Range Rover together with the next Gen Range Rover Sport will move to an all-new aluminum-rich platform. The so-called modular longitudinal architectural MLA architecture will be significantly lighter than today's D7U and will be used in basically every single new Jaguar Land Rover in the future. So I think it is a Mule Herald, yes. Okay. That makes more sense because I can't see them wanting to do a production roll cage in a, in a Range Rover. kind of just takes all the wind out of the Defender sail. And if they really are producing, well, which they are, uh, a significantly lighter aluminum vehicle, they're probably going to want a roll cage in the mid to early stages <laughs> of development and testing. Well, they probably haven't sorted out all the rigidity issues yet. Yeah, there may not be a structure under the silhouette, you know, a production structure to speak of. Um, so it's that's true as well. They may have gutted the heck out of it and had to put something back in just to keep from folding it up while they're driving it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, kind of what they did with the defenders for the Bond movie, where they they kind of. <laughs> they, you know, I was I was going to suggest it'll be in the next Bond movie, but uh, <laughs> we haven't even seen the 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 newest Bond movie that was supposed to be out. Or or they're working on a new Bowler Luxo cat. <laughs> so that is Land Rover news uh, for the month of August. Before we leave the news segment, though, the Montana Rovers group, they got Oxford for after it was in um, Minnesota. Minnesota. Thank you. After it was in Minnesota, then Montana got the got Oxford and then passed it off to the West Coast. Uh, but they had a nice write-up on what happened with Oxford and Montana. We'll have a link to it in the show notes so you can check out what, uh, what happened to Oxford while I was in Montana. And if you stay tuned, in just a minute, you'll get to hear David Short talk about the next leg of the Oxford in America story. And now it's time for our Oxford in America updates. David Short, you are joining us from the West Coast of the United States. Yeah. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me back on the show. Um, yeah, I am sitting here in Pangolin 4x4 in Springfield, Oregon. Me and my co-pilot, Mike McKaig, we are doing the last uh, minute wrench turning and fixes on Oxford, getting it ready for the trip. Outstanding, outstanding, and I, the our listeners will not know this, but uh, Dave has the cell phone right at his mouth, and so our our visual view is of I think his fingers. It's Apparently, like looking out through his mouth. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's Oxford. There's yeah, Oxford. There's the motor. So, what's happened to Oxford? Then, since the last time we talked on the show, we had it had just left just left Pittsburgh and headed to Minnesota. Right. So last yeah, so went to Minnesota. Uh, our good friend. Uh, Eric Olson, uh, Dr. Dr. Eric, Dr. Rick, I'm sorry. He and his buddies up there, David, they took Oxford to their Minnesota Land Rover Club's uh, summer picnic there up in uh, Bacchus. Uh, that actually came to fruition. They talked about it the last episode and it actually did happen this year. Uh, he also took it around to a couple other places. They, um, he also took it up to uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and uh, got it to be at the edge of Lake Superior, which I thought was kind of fun. Uh, got a good trip out of it there. Um, it got a good showing, several good showings up there in Minnesota. A couple, uh, I think three or four planned events. Each of them had about 20 or 30 folks showing up to, to look at it. And from there, uh, Dr. Rick went westward and met our uh, new friends, um, Jason Swant and Matt McCune over in um, Montana. Montana. Yeah, sorry, brain lock here. Montana. And they did the handoff over in North Dakota, the edge of North Dakota and Montana, did the handoff of Oxford there. And those fine folks took Oxford into Montana for about a week and a half in Montana, where they did a, uh, a showing in Livingston, Montana, and which had about uh, 20 or 30 trucks show up at Livingston to the Livingston Civic Center. And they all kind of gathered around and had a good time with Oxford there. From Livingston, they went on down to uh, Yellowstone National Park, which was a great 
great trip for Oxford. They got to do some pictures in front of the iconic uh, stone gates, went up by the old uh, C- Civilian Conservation Corps Works Project Lodge that was uh, built there back in the, in the 30s. And of course, got a great picture of Oxford next to Old Faithful when it was erupting. Uh, I think some folks have seen that on the internet. That's a great iconic picture now. I think it's going to be one that lives with it for a while. Oxford with uh, Old Faithful. And, 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 fort- and fortunately, Old Faithful was the only geyser that day. That day, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the Oxford went on from uh, from from Yellowstone and moved further west and got handed off to uh, the Pacific Coast Rovers Club. Our new friend Bruce Franklin there. I met him over the internet and he got us uh, helped us out here. Went from uh, Washington State up in the far Pacific Northwest. Did a day over at uh, Lagrange Garage in Seattle and did a showing there. About twenty or thirty tru- uh, trucks and folks showed up there. And then from Seattle, it went down to Portland, Oregon. Uh, and from Portland, Oregon, they had a, a great idea there in Portland, Oregon. They had a lot of fun with it. They they spent a day at Ships Mechanical, and Ships uh, is one of the well-known traditional series shops in Portland, Oregon. Ships does a lot of good restoration and repair work on, on older series trucks. And they had a good showing there, and they went from the old trucks down to the a place called The Matrix, which is a new high-end shop on the other side of Portland, where they sell Range Rovers and newer cars. So they took Oxford from old to new in the same town with a big caravan of about 20 or 30 trucks. So I thought that was a great fun idea and they spent a good time there. And then from there, they got carried down here to Springfield, Oregon, where we are sitting on top of it right now here at Pangolin 4x4. And we've been doing lots and lots and lots of little repairs that all add up to a bunch of big work on the truck and uh, getting it ready for our trip, which should start on Tuesday, September 1st of this uh, next week. I think we're going to tidy up the last bits we're tidying up on now, trying to figure out why we're down down a little bit on power, then take it out for a quick test drive this afternoon up on a little mountain range with Ike. And then uh, Sunday, I think we're going to go out to the coast to um, do just a little uh, one-hour drive out to Florence on the coast of Oregon and just spend a grab, grab lunch out there on Sunday and and just do a quick look there. And then on Monday, come back, make any last minute repairs or fixes that we broke over the weekend to make sure it's all good and bedded in. And like I said, we'll take off on Tuesday morning and start on our trip across the uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California, Western Nevada, and ending up uh, in Las Vegas on September 11th. That's our first major stop. Don't lose Oxford. Don't gamble with it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, we won't. I don't know if we get much for it or not. <laughs> Oh, no, we're going to be a, a good good show at the dealership, and um, and then moving on to Moab and Colorado, and, and on and on. I don't. We can do the whole trip here on the phone now if you want, or we could just kind of do it month by month at a time, or we are trip by trip at a time, stop by stop. Yeah, no, keep going. Tell us to. So, what's the general nature of things? And and you're ending up in in Virginia for Mar at the beginning of October. Yeah, so the the start of the trip here, port uh, over in Oregon, we think we're going to start at Port Orford, which is down on the southern coast of Oregon uh, and end up at Mar in October at the Rover Owners Association of Virginia's Mid-Atlantic Rally. Uh, but in between, yeah, we hope to do some backcountry off, off piste, if you will, uh, out in the outback, runs through the desert of southwest uh, United States through Nevada and Utah and, and uh, Southern California, come back up through Las Vegas, from Las Vegas going up to Colorado. We're going to meet a bunch of folks in Moab, Utah. I know the Great American Rover Rally was canceled, but a few folks already made plans to travel out there. So it's going to be a few folks' independent trips out to Moab, Utah. And we're going to do a day in Moab on September 15th with Oxford and those guys. Uh, We'll be taking it easy with Oxford, but we'll be getting around and just driving around through some of the trails and seeing some of the sites in Moab on September 15th. And then ease up from there into Colorado, hope to go to the Ure area. Uh, One of our uh, friends from the Virginia Land River Club from ROAV, He's got a ranch up near Ure, so we plan to kind of stop in Ure, stop at his house, uh, maybe slide Oxford in the garage if we have to, and do anything we have to do there to tidy up. And then from there, we'll head right back south again to Oklahoma uh, and just go right across the top of Oklahoma on the 21st of September. From Oklahoma, across to Arkansas, through the Ozarks. Uh, hoping to stop in a couple of state parks along the way. I think we're going to see the, the Arkansas Land Rover Club when we're in Arkansas. And then from there, we'll go from Arkansas into uh, Tennessee, and we're going to stop at Memphis and see. We've got reservations booked at Graceland RV and Camp Park. And I just 
I'm so excited because I imagine the people watching at the Graceland RV park is going to be second to none. It'll, it'll probably match Walmart after midnight. You might be right about that. You know, Harold calls Oxford. It's like Elvis, when Elvis comes to your house to party. So I think it's kind of appropriate. Yeah. So from uh, Memphis over to uh, Lynchburg, Tennessee to see Jack Daniels from Lynchburg, Tennessee over to Asheville, North Carolina to see the Land Rover experience at the Biltmore. We've got that locked in for, I think it's the 28th, that uh, Monday, August 28th. And that's all uh, starting to take shape there at the Biltmore. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think they're going to have a reduced, a a significantly reduced fee for event for guests to come and and take a look and and spend some time with Oxford and spend some time a little bit on the trails there at the uh, the Biltmore with the proceeds going to uh, help get Oxford across the United States and help, help fund the project out. And then from the Biltmore, it's just to Damascus, Virginia, and then ends up at uh, Giles County back in at the mid Atlantic rally. So it tidies all up at the end. So that's kind of the loose, the loose uh, schedule provided old, old Oxford cooperates with this. That's the schedule we're going to make. Yeah, that's and that's the big if in this whole equation. Yeah. You, you break uh, anything and everything goes out the window. Yeah. But it's not going to happen. We've been doing a whole week of solid work on the truck, trying to make her more reliable Um, one of the things that was fun, I think some of you guys might've seen the picture. We pulled the axles out of the back and you know, the axles on Oxford are the, um, they're not full floating. They're the semi floating. I think what they call it. Yeah. Yeah, And as I, as I saw from the pictures, one of them wasn't much of a pull. It kind of came out on its own. When the guys did the first overland back in the fifties, they had some problems with one of the axles and they, and they did a, a field repair, which was, if you read the book, they'll tell you it's pretty difficult to do. And then the last Overland in 2019, the lads coming back from Singapore back to London, they had a similar problem where they lost an axle out of the right rear while they're driving down the road. And uh, the axle just came out while they were driving uh, because the, the bearing failed. And when the axle came out, of course, it just slid out little by little while it was driving at highway speed. And then we pulled the axle out here and you can see the, the spiral score mark where the axle was coming out and rubbing on the axle housing as it was easing its way out at speed. So it's kind of funny to see the, the evidence and the history of the previous activities on the truck still still hang with it now, but here at Ike's at Pangolin, he's got he's got five of all the parts on the shelves, and so we took all both axles out, took them, uh, and both axles were showing signs of wear and coming apart again. Took both axles out, cleaned them back down, got the right factory parts back on them, got them pressed back in at the right way, and uh, and got all that buttoned up, and feel a lot better about that now. So doing lots of things just to improve the reliability like that to get the truck back, uh, back, uh, I don't know if it's a hundred percent, but we're at least 90% now. I, you know, I, I was shaking my head while you were re- talking about the plan and, and the timeline. I, I hope all goes well. I think even <laughs> with, even without having any breakdowns, uh, I think just traveling at that speed is going to be, and in the time, uh, it seems, it seems ambitious. You're going to need a good tailwind. Well, we're our, our schedule. I mean, I was going pretty quick on the words, uh, but our schedule shows about 200 to 250 miles a day, which I'm told should be fairly reasonable, but robust. Yeah. Not the like, first couple of days that may work well by, by the later in the trip, you may not think uh, 250 is, is a good goal. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll have to see. We've, I've got, uh, if now the, the, we arrive at the mid Atlantic rally, uh, on the 29th at night of September and the rally starts on the 1st of October. The rally lasts from October one through October four. So if we arrive at the rally, October two or October three, we still arrive and it's still okay. We just, we just won't arrive ahead of people will we'll arrive with people. And that's not too bad. So if we lose a day or two along the trip, I think we got a day or two of slack if, if something bad happens. And we got, uh, I think we can get to North, we can get to Las Vegas in nine days, but I got us planning to make it in 11. So I got a day or two of slack there uh, as well in case we have to. So there's a couple of days of slack built in. Uh, not a whole lot. It's going to be tough. It's going to be, um, we're going we're to have to stay on point on schedule, uh, but we do have a little bit of slack planned in it. Is this all off road or are you actually taking paved roads? I thought this was originally had been conceived as a, an off road trail journey, right? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, none of it's going to be on highway. Uh, thank God. And obviously uh, it's, there's going <laughs> yes. to be a couple of paved back roads uh, where we're going to take uh, as we, it, and we're going to be hopscotching or hops, uh, hopping between uh, gravel, uh, back country road and gravel road and secondary road and gravel road. When we get to Oklahoma, I think going across Oklahoma, it's all on gravel road, gravel and dirt road uh, going through parts of uh, Arkansas and Tennessee. It's kind of 
back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Colorado will be a little bit of a, again, the same will be back and forth between back roads, back country roads and, and gravel roads, national forest roads. So it's going to be a little bit of everything, but we are going to stay off the highway and there's no sense getting Oxford up on the highway. Well, I don't think you can legally drive an interstate in that truck. Cause I don't think you make the minimum speed. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to improve that, but yeah, I don't think we make the minimum speed at the moment either. So well, you certainly wouldn't without pushing it really hard. <laughs> yeah, or hooking it to a truck as it goes by. Well, yeah, there's that. Even if you were even if you were going 50 miles an hour and could go above uh, 40, I, you don't want to uh, have someone come up behind you at a high rate of speed and then all nah. of a sudden like, hey, there's this slow moving truck in front of me. <laughs> Yeah, no. So we're we'll keep it on the secondary roads for sure. But that's that's why it's gonna. I mean, you could t- you could cross the country in in four or five days with a modern vehicle. We're gonna cross it in thirty days with Oxford. That's why it's going a little slower, taking longer dirt roads and and uh, things like that. So how do people keep track of the journey? Will you be making updates? Uh, is that Facebook? Is that the Rove website? Yeah. So the Rove website has a schedule posted on it, and we'll be updating the schedule as the internet allows us to connect and as we get more fidelity on times and places. Uh, so that'd be where you look for looking forward to see where we've been and some of the, the photos as we go. The Facebook site's going to be the best to keep track of uh, picture updates of things as we're going. Uh, yet I don't, there's, no, there's not much picture updates from the trip so far because we haven't started it yet. Picture of us at a donut shop yesterday was a lot of fun. I had a good donut shop. <laughs> I did see that. That was very nice. But yeah, the, so the Facebook page will be, uh, will be where we'll have most of our updates. And, you know, part of this trip is the truck and the traveling. Uh, but part of the trip is also seeing part of the country and seeing part of the country is also eating part of the country. Cause I like to eat. <laughs> and uh, so I, so just a, you will see pictures of more donut shops and pictures of more uh, taco trailers or, or just fun places we stop and eat. Cause we're going to try to stop at fun places to eat. I'm hoping for breweries, Dave. I'm hoping for breweries. Oh, right, well, yeah, yeah. We'll try to do some brew pubs for sure. We're going to do one last night, but we're also, I mean, I have to remind you, it's time of COVID. We went to a brew pub last night that was heaving, and we decided that was probably not the smartest choice. Right. So we uh, we eased away and went to like, we went to a pizzeria instead. It, but uh, it was uh, food was fine, but there was a lot less crowded and made all this a lot happier. The last thing that Mike and I want to do is get sick in the middle of this trip. So we're trying to play smart with all that. I mean, I think you can see here we've got we've been wearing masks. There's a mask on the side of the truck. We've been wearing masks while we're here at the shop trying to keep uh trying to keep safe with that well the nice thing is once you're rolling you don't have to worry about uh droplets and such accumulating inside of oxford because there is good, <laughs> good ventilation yeah the air conditioning we have improved the air conditioning a little bit uh it's uh <laughs> you no know, yeah it's gonna flow through no problem not a not a problem at all and don't forget what uh harold noticed and be mindful of don't put anything on the dash that you want don't want to lose because it will go out the front even while yeah. the vehicle's in motion i had a pair, a pair of earplugs fly forward out the the dash vents yes yes I've, I've noticed that as well when i'm when i drove it to gettysburg i was i caught some paper that was about the uh unceremoniously exit the vehicle so i'm, I'm aware of that phenomenon so yes, there are no screens yeah, we've got a whole jug of earplugs we're bringing with us. So if we lose one, we'd be okay. We've got a whole, a whole big plastic jug I bought, the 400 pack, because I knew it was going to be a long month. Are you traveling by yourself, or do you have an escort? I think we'll have we'll be by ourselves for most of us. We had an escort kind of planned out, best laid plans of mice and men. The escort kind of fell apart on us. Uh, so we'll be driving. I think we'll be driving by ourselves mostly, but I think we'll also be catching people up uh, for short join-ups or meetups as we go along, but we, we still have one person that might meet us in Oklahoma and finish the trip from Oklahoma to Virginia. Uh, that might happen. Uh, they're still waffling back and forth on the internet with us, but that may be our only uh, hope for a, a solid escort. But, but when we're in Colorado from Utah all the way to, all the way to Oklahoma, that whole leg, I'm going to have six or eight folks from Virginia with me. Um, all of our friends from there, Peter Vollers from the Vermont Overland will be there. Bob Steele from the Virginia Club and and uh, a couple of those guys there, Mike Boggs and so forth and so on. Larry, uh, so we'll have a we'll have a good a good group with us in the middle of the country in case something goes wrong. But we'll be out there on our own for some of it as well. So it'll be a kind of a mix. Is is Bob bringing his new defender? I'm trying to get him to do that. <laughs> I'm trying to get him to bring the new defender. Nice. And I'm trying to get Larry uh, Michelin to bring his uh, Red Series Three. So we'll have, uh, I want Bob to pull the series three out there on the trailer. 
So we have the series with Oxford uh, and, and have that. Larry, they both may bring their their Range Rover Classics. I'm not sure what they're doing. They've been back and forth. Uh, but yeah, I, w- I would be happy. Of course, I'm making decisions for Bob now. Yeah, Bob, bring your Defender out. Of course. <laughs> that's, my, that's my decision. Look at this way, Bob. It's not going to go fast. He's not going to challenge you to be going above 42 miles an hour. Yeah, no, that's the deal. <laughs> that's the deal. We told that's what we told Larry. Larry was going to bring his uh, Range Rover, but he said, "I want to bring my series. I'm afraid I'll be holding people up." I said, "Larry, you will not be <laughs> holding up." <laughs> <laughs> Oxford is a series. Yes. Yeah, he'll only be holding people up if he's behind you. Yes, yes, exactly. So, so hopefully, Larry will bring a series and uh, and have a good time. Part of here's the Machiavellian part of it all is I want Bob to bring his new Defender so that when we get out to Colorado, I'll say, "Hey, Bob, you want to drive Oxford? I'll drive your Defender for the day." <laughs> and that'll give, that'll give us a little bit of air conditioning, cushy seats, and oh, yeah. et cetera. Give us, you know, and let Bob bounce around like a ping pong ball in Oxford for a day. Of course, yeah, it'll be new and fun for him, and we'll appreciate the break. So that's my Machiavellian reason. Well done, don't sir. don't listen to this, Bob. Just kind of keep going. That's the reason why I want him to to keep going on the uh, to keep bringing the the defender. Well, you think the ride is rough in Oxford or something? Um, well, once we load it down, I think it might settle down a little bit. Right now, empty. It's a bit. It's a bit springy. We'll say. Really? It's yeah. it, to me it's less the ride than it is the constant attention to throttle position where the steering wheel may or may not want to be uh that you have to mentally you're always always driving you know always uh, constantly watching well, well the steering wheel is a very fluid thing you never really <laughs> hold it in one spot exactly unless you're unless you're parked yeah. <laughs> gentlemen gentlemen I, I hate to burst your bubble on that one but we replaced the steering column Whoa, in the okay. steering box Right. And we replaced the steering relay in the frame. Well, the relay and, was bad. We did what we could with it. So that's no surprise. And we replaced a bad tie rod in. And we, re- we tightened up a swivel ball. And now the truck goes where you point it. Uh, it's a shocking, shocking difference. Well, every time you hit a bump, you don't have to guess which direction the tires are going to be pointing when it hits the ground. So it's steering is, I mean, it's still not one finger steering, but it's steering is remarkably more, yeah, mo better because uh, it was, as you guys can attest, it was a bit trifling when we had it on the west uh, east coast. Uh, with the, it was just heavily worn. So we do into a lot of like a lot of little things. You can see all those little things. Uh, yeah, the pro- it was it was flat. heavily worn, and with the the relay that was rusted solid, it was uh, very yeah. high effort at the same time. Yeah, we we got the, we were messing with relay, and, and the relay I think has a had a leak in it or something because it was out of fluid again. Yeah, and it well, was it's probably uh, why it rusted out, and and we we jammed oil in it and got it working better, but we knew it wasn't a long term fix. It was just to get by, and, and it got by pretty good. But yeah, so anyways, we're we're a lot better off steering wise. So that's I can attest, you know, steering good, power maybe not so much, but steering good, it breaks fair. You know, <laughs> it's like the start of a country music song, I think. But yeah. uh, well, you're not going fast, so yeah, just put actually, your foot out the door. That's the beginning of of Hot Rod Lincoln, I think. Actually, I think so too. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Two of the uh, brake cylinders were were seized and not not pumping right. And one of the brake cylinders, I don't know where this happened. One of the brake cylinders, the they said the uh, the pistons and the brake cylinders were wrapped with Teflon tape to make a seal. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we've we've undone that and put the right the new rubber pistons in there like they're supposed to be, et cetera. So we like I said, this has been a heavy week of heavy repairs, a lot of little things, but all of it should add up to a lot more reliability. So what I'm hearing is that uh, folks who should follow along on Facebook and also on the Rove website for where you are. And sounds like you would be open to having Land Rover owners as you're cruising through the country come out and see you and maybe give you an escort through their community. Yeah, I'm hoping I can put our nightly destinations up there a couple of days in advance so that if folks want to and we're going to be staying mostly at like uh, state parks or campgrounds, uh, there'll be a few spots where we won't be doing that. But most of the time we'll be at state parks or campgrounds. So I'm hoping to put those out a couple of days in advance. So if anybody's local in the area want to swing on by and and bring us a beverage, you know, they can buy you a tea, but they can bring me a beverage <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and just uh, hang out with us for the night. I think it would be great uh, just to share the truck with more people as we go across the country. And if someone wants to meet us and ride the next day with us for a day, you know, hey, great. That's more power to them. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Dave. I appreciate you giving us uh, the update as uh, sounds like this is the, the meat of uh, Oxford in America. Finally, finally doing something interesting, I guess, instead of it just sitting in the garage, right? Yeah, Mike and I, of course, Mike's been with me for the week so far. We've been out here since 
Wednesday. Today is Saturday. The truck's been here since Monday, but Mike and I have, uh, we're just getting a little itchy now. We, we, we're tired of working on it. We need to start driving it. You know, it's time to get going. And it's super exciting that I, I think I wrote on the internet the other day. I think I've pushed Oxford across the country from behind my computer for a year. And now it's time to actually start driving it. And so we're getting super excited about getting this thing actually going, actually doing the trip, getting this whole major project uh, into the, the, yeah, I just, very excited, very anxious to get started. Very, can't wait to get going. Now, now you're doing the first Overland North America edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The next, I think we call it the next Overland because I think the first and the last, this is the next and there'll be more nexts after this. Let's hope. Thanks, John, for having us back on for the, uh, for the monthly update for the Oxford America Project. Again, everyone can keep up with our schedule at www.roav.org. That's Rover Owners Association of Virginia, roav.org. And then keep in touch with us on our daily basis on our Facebook page at Oxford America. That's our Facebook group. You can join there, see all the updates and the pictures of what, and keep uh, just be a part of the trip with us as we go along. Thanks again for having us on. And now on this Understeer podcast, we're going to talk to our new contributor added to the show, Brian Joslin. Welcome back, Brian. And uh, you are the editor of Alloy and Grit magazine, which unfortunately, like the Defender of old, is ending production. Yeah. Former publisher of Alloy and Grit magazine. <laughs> I guess now former publisher. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Have you published the last art, uh, the last edition, or is that coming up? Yeah. No, no, no. The the, the last edition was the uh, uh, the spring issue, um, which was really kind of a combined winter spring because of uh, you know some some content timing toward the end of putting together the winter issue. Um, so yeah, that's that's been out that went out in um, gosh, what was it? Probably March at this point. I think it was just after the, yeah, when the pandemic in here and started. Yeah. 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 I, I've lost track. Um, well, I, yeah, I know that I had that issue in possession before you announced that that would be the last. Right. Yeah. We wanted to make sure, you know, subscribers got their issues and, uh, and we did, did make the announcement. Uh, you know, we've, um, worked out a deal with Overland Journal to replace uh, existing subscribers um, issues with, uh, with issues of Overland Journal. And just in the last week or so, uh, saw people starting to get their first issue ever of, uh, for some people, first issue ever of yes. Overland Journal. Obviously, there's some some overlap there. We had subscribers to both and, you know, those, those subscribers got it a, a, an additional extension. But uh uh, had some people reach out to me and say, you know, it was really a nice thing for you to do. It was really classy. Um, the, <laughs> if I can share the, the other interesting thing about that part of the discussion is I had a lot of, uh, a handful of people reached out to me directly and said, you know, um, Overland journals, nice magazine. It's not the same, obviously. Uh, but, uh, and not just from a content standpoint, you guys really put together a nice magazine. And what, what's ironic about that statement is uh, ooh, seven years ago or so when I started laying out the concept for, for doing a Land Rover magazine, um, Overland Journal was what I kind of benchmarked against in terms of quality, you know, in terms of the, the physical product and the, uh, the visual appeal and the tactile appeal. And um, so you know, I've gotten to know Scott Brady fairly well over the last few years. We show up at, at a lot of, you know, Land Rover launch events and things like that. And, and, um, it was a, it was a pretty natural decision to, uh, to approach him, you know, when, uh, when we realized we weren't going to continue the magazine and, uh, he was really graceful about, uh, you know, absorbing, uh, that obligation. And, um, so it's worked out well. It's kind of come full circle. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I start out looking at what he was doing and he ended up, um, you know, fulfilling our, our last orders. So it's been kind of an interesting story. So what exactly happened to the cause of demise, uh, the end of production? I won't say demise. Let's just say end of production. Of yeah. Alloy and uh, well, frankly, you know, the, um, the, the last couple of issues were tough for us to put together. Steve and Dan and Chris and I all had, um, you know, other things in our lives. I mean, this was not our, our only, uh, job or obligation. Um, so, you know, getting out and covering the events and getting out and planning the content, uh, had, had become a, a bigger challenge, uh, doing it as a effectively a uh, side project. Um, you know, I, and I'll, I'll admit a lot of that was on me. I have a, a I took a, a day job a couple of years ago, um, you know, and had to pull away from the, 
um, from doing alloy and grid exclusively. And it, uh, it became way more of a job than I really wanted, frankly. But, um, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, everyone else had, had obligations as well. Chris and Dan were both, you know, creative directors at, at, at agencies or marketing agencies. And we all understood that, you know, that their um, commitments at times would be limited. And, and so we had some conflicts just getting uh, the, the last couple issues together uh, from a content standpoint. Uh, but really, you know, the fork in the stake there was uh, just, you know, the COVID crisis. Um, when events started canceling, it was, we didn't see a timeline that was realistic for us resuming, being able to put together issues the way we wanted to do them. Well, events and is your content, really, being able to get yeah. around the country and see people's trucks and meet people. And- exactly. So each each event, you know, I mean, we could we could do the magazine without event coverage um, in some yeah, fashion. Much smaller magazine. It would, it would. Um, you know, we counted on club contributions, you know, for, for some of those events, but we, we tried to get out to as many of the, the major events as we could. Not well, that's just the other the, side of it is that there's a lot of travel involved. And right. If you exactly. can't travel as well because of COVID, you can't, can't get anywhere to cover anything if there was anything to cover. Exactly. So aside from not having events themselves to cover, you know, we, we found a lot of our connections to people and unique vehicles by being at those events, you know, uh, stuff shows up there and, and you get talking to people and, and you discover firsthand what's, uh, you know, feature worthy. And, um, you know, you can ignore something over in the corner until you talk to the owner and discover it's got a history or something. You just can't replace that uh, remotely. And then of course, as, as you just mentioned, Harold, actually getting out to, <laughs> to the vehicle to either to shoot it or to, uh, to experience it with the owner for the story, just not in the cards for the short term. So like I mentioned, we had had some recent history where, where the, the last couple issues got, got to be long to put together. And we didn't want to have this unknown hanging out there as to when the next issue was going to come. Combine that with, you know, the Land Rover advertising community is small. We weren't sure how those companies that were supporting us were going to survive, you know, long term. Um, it was, it seems like they're doing fairly well. Lucky Eight and Atlantic British, uh, you know, a lot of the other companies, Knightsbridge, Overland, um, a lot of those companies that supported us um, have continued to do well, which is great for them. But we weren't certain we could count on that. And, you know, companies like Cummins were pulling back on marketing and some of the, you know, some of the companies we'd been trying to talk to, uh, tire companies and some of the other, you know, larger advertisers were just, pulling back budgets, not knowing, you know, how long this, uh, uh, crisis was going to, was going to continue. So, um, there was just too much uncertainty. Uh, you know, we ran it really lean. So we, we decided it was probably in our best interest to, um, to end it, you know, while we knew, uh, what the outcome uh, was going to be for us uh, from a business standpoint and, uh, and just to wind it down for now. And, um, and sp- see how this all works out. So So you're saying there's a chance it could come back. (laughs) (laughs) I heard you say wind down. (laughs) I'm hearing the for now part of it. Uh, Yeah. That's, that's got me thinking the same thing. I'd I'd like to, I'd like to think it could come back, but I think, um, you know, there's, there's four of us that had put this together. Um, uh, You know, if, if you talk to each one of us, you'd probably get a different version of, of um, you know, what it took to put the magazine together. Uh, each of us had different priorities, I think. And so, um, you know, reading between the lines, it um, it was a good time to, to kind of rethink the, uh, the project overall. So well, the, the silver lining that I'm, I'm hearing is that y'all had day jobs. So it's not like you, you're not able to feed your family or anything out of this. Right. Yeah. And, you know, like I mentioned, Chris and, and Dan were both really, really busy with, uh, you know, with, uh, ongoing projects. And it was, frankly, that was part of, you know, part of the delay in, in getting things put together was just, you know, them carving out time to, to wrap up an issue once we had content together. Um, I have a, you know, a daytime marketing job, uh, you know, for an automotive parts supplier. So, uh, it sounds like it would be great, but it's, it's a lot of really, uh, time consuming kind of boring marketing work. And, uh, it, it kind of grew to consume way more of my schedule than I had anticipated. And, um, I just couldn't get time away. You know, once you're, once you're not working for yourself exclusively, um, you know, planning out your 10 or 12 uh, vacation days a year to be on the road. And, um, 
you know, to, to do stuff for a magazine becomes a real challenge. This, this whole project took a lot of toll on, on all our families, I think as well, because when we weren't at our day job, we were working on, on Alloy uh, for the most part. And uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a combination of factors. There's no one thing, but um, for certain, the, the COVID crisis was pushed um, over the edge. So to definitely speak. pushed it over the yeah. edge for sure. I was, so, I guess I was unaware that, that sounds like all of you were, had, had, your own day jobs and that, that alloy and grit was more of a kind of a secondary, what, what do the kids call it these days? A side hustle. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that that makes that, that enters into it. I mean, you, and you had a high quality magazine, very well yeah. done and, and respected and as I said, high quality. So that makes it even more understandable. There, there was, there was a time when Steve and I were working on it exclusively. Uh, but it, you know, it, it's a small market. Um, we were kind of, feeling our way through uh, the enterprise end of, of running a magazine. I mean, what people saw is, is actually, frankly, the easy part. Um, I think right. Um, right. making, making a magazine is easy. Making an enter- enterprise out of it um, is challenge. And, you know, there's a, a limited pool of advertisers. Um, there's a limited pool of owners that are willing to, to actually proactively spend money on a magazine. I mean, I think we're all guilty of, enjoying the free content when it comes our way, but you know, the, to, to produce a book like that, you know, we paid photographers, we paid writers, we obviously had to pay a printer, um, you know, and it was not a cheap thing to put out. So hey, try making um, a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have been actually. Yes. So I, so I know that. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Making a quality product is easy. Selling that product and making enough to, to, to yeah. feed your family is another. And uh, yeah. And you know, uh, from the advertising side, it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like BMW or Porsche parts, right? There's a, a limited number of companies that, that offer even original or replacement parts, let alone, you know, a deep accessories catalog, um, you know, for, for any of these things, it's, uh, it's just a really limited, uh, niche to survive as a single publication. And, um, frankly, I was always hoping that it would be a, um, a launch pad to additional, titles and additional projects, but that really wasn't in the cards for the rest of, uh, you know, the business partners. I mean, like a, like a Jeep version or a, a Bronco version? Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have some other concepts that I had in the hopper at the same time. And, uh, it's just, you know, um, they weren't truck magazines. They were, they were, uh, European car kind of oh, magazines. Okay. I was going to say yeah. the air cooled Porsche community could probably, <laughs> oh, they have enough, they have enough magazines. Yeah. But <laughs> for some reason there's, those guys are so hungry for that stuff. They could I know. support another one. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, the economies of scale were not great for a, uh, you know, for a single Mark magazine and, and, you know, Landover, um, gave us some support, but we always hope to have a deeper, stronger relationship with them. And, um, yeah, they just have other priorities. Um, you know, they were very, very focused on digital content and we built the magazine really to be a physical product because there's, I mean, to make a business case for a Land Rover website, you know, in the, in the page view churn that you would need, there's just not enough material out there, uh, to make, you know, a Land Rover news, uh, <laughs> website, a, a real viable option. So we needed it to be a product that people would, uh, you know, invest a little bit in and, and Land Rover's priorities were not in print. You know, the, the numbers just weren't there. They wanted eyeballs more than, than um, I felt more than deep relationships with, uh, you know, with people who are advocates for the brand. So another challenge we never really overcame. I mean, they were, we were grateful for their, their support and um, you know, in advertising and, and with PR and access to vehicles and things like that. But, uh, well, that's mirrored in, I think the, what they've done here in the U S where they had that, uh, the four by four festival, which yeah. it was all, you know, younger folks and it was active. It was the activities. It was not about yeah. the vehicle. It was about the activities. And it just kind of mirrors up with what you're saying. Yeah. I guess well, and uh, their, their target demographic and all that is, is people that are young enough that they don't read print media. Uh, to a degree. Yeah. I mean, there's, I, I've got conflicting, uh, figures on that. Younger readers actually read uh, magazines at a higher rate than, than, uh, Gen X and millennials or uh, Gen X and, uh, and boomers do at this point, but you know, you have to, you have to attract them. Is that actual, is that print print magazines? Yes. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's been a bit of a print resurgence. They, you know, 
It's just like we, we kind of like vinyl like, came. Uh, yeah, vinyl. We'll so, they're, yeah. So, so they're they're reading them ironically, in other words. <laughs> Perhaps they are spending money on them. Whether they read them or not doesn't really matter. As long so, as yeah, it's true. Them, you just got to sell them. You don't care what they do with them. That's right. On that note, um, you know, the, the the messages, the outreach that we got from people after we announced we were going to shut things down was was really overwhelming. And I was just actually collecting, um, you know, some of the comments from uh, from Facebook just to archive them for, you know, for for our own use. And uh, well, if you you're, you're welcome to share some here, if you wish, you know. To- yeah, I mean, the, the, the consistent thread was that the people who subscribed really appreciated what we did. You know, the, the, the comments that I pulled out. A lot of them said, you know, this was hands down the the best magazine the Land Rover community has ever seen, you know, and it's and it's a real loss. And I'm not saying that to, you know, toot my own horn. I, I, yeah, but I it's true. Succeeded, I thing. think we succeeded in what we set out to do. Uh, well, that's you know. that's just it. You set out to make a, a premium product. Uh, yeah. You know. I mean, Land Rover magazines, there's enough of them around that give the content, but you guys did it in a different way. Yeah. Well, and for us, we, we always wanted that to be, you know, content that, that that really didn't have an expiration date that you could come back to and feel like you're reading it for the first time if, you know, two years later and it's something you still want to read. You know, I mean, um, not to knock the uh, some of the British publications, but, you know, I can't tell you how many I've, uh, I've opened and said I didn't. Didn't they do that break, you know, rebuild story once before? Maybe. Oh yeah, they have. Oh, def- oh, absolutely, it, it just, they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And uh, and and so we tried to avoid doing content like that just to fill pages. We really tried to go out and uh, you know and find unique material and um, you know tried to do as as little we as we could with stock photography. Um, that was always one of the challenges with new vehicles. You know, everyone's given the same packet of two hundred pictures to to produce articles from and. You know, sometimes we scoured deep to uh, to find the ones that we knew no one else was going to run. I think the uh, second to last issue, which was the the new Defender on the cover, uh, which was our, our fall winner mm-hmm. or our fall issue last year, um, it was a stock photo, but it was one no one else was running. Everyone was running those, uh, you know, the profile pictures in the quarry or whatever. And and uh, you know, deep in the set somewhere was this uh, this picture of this thing coming through the uh, the field of, of flowers and. With just a little bit of color tuning for the season, it uh, it really looked like an original picture. So I, I I think we just that was our mission was to do something unique, um, and give people something they weren't getting from other publications. I, I thought the photography was top notch and just made it stand out. That was yeah, like you said, you always had unique, really cool photos. You had a, certainly I don't know who your photographer was, but they are they definitely have. So we didn't have a photographer. Dan took a lot of photography for the uh, for the magazine. I took some a lot of. The, actually a lot of the product stuff that ended up in the gear section I shot on my dining room table. Uh, but we, you know, Dan, Dan had a really, um, good eye for, uh, what was happening on Instagram and found a lot of our freelance photographers on Instagram. People reached out and said, please let me shoot for you, you know, and, and, uh, it, it was great. And, and that's a great, great way to filter. <laughs> you know, you can tell what, uh, how good they really know. are because you already yeah, see their who's, products. Who's got an eye for it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that's personally. I think that's why the magazine to me stood out was your your the photography stood out. Well, to me, it wasn't just content; it was also the materials in the you know, that you used in the actual printing. The, just the the quality of the physical product was so much better. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked to people, you know, that said, "Hey, you know, what if you just." Uh, you know, you could probably make a little more money if you went with a lighter stock or, or cut it down in size. And I said, no, 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 no. But that's what makes we, alloy and grit what it was. I mean, exactly. You can't, we you can't we, take that away. We built that physical product, you know, basically we, I knew what the, the thing had to feel like in your hand. And so when I was getting quotes, you know, I didn't even look at printers that couldn't do beyond a eight and a half by 11 kind of trim size. I needed something that was a little oversized. And then we started looking at, you know, what paperweight we knew we were going to do about a hundred pages of content, uh, what paperweight gets it up to at least a quarter inch thick. And so, you know, and then the, the cover stock needed to be heavier. It really needed to be a cover, not just a, another page. And so all of those considerations uh, were done before we, <laughs> before we ever really started making content. We knew I had, um, you know, samples of, of naked white pages of, you know, bound paper, um, you know, just, uh, sampling different printers, uh, you know, 
uh, stock the, so that we knew what the physical was, product would be. The fact that it was bound and not just a couple staples down the oh, spine. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that just that that right there is a detail that nobody does. Yeah. Yeah. And that allows them to sit nicely on the shelf and be kind of displayed. You know, the spine is is part of the, uh, you know, the graphic design in a way. Like, so like a book. Yeah. All, all of those things were intentional and um, they were just the standard. You know, we weren't going to we weren't going to step back from that um, any more than we would have gone to black and white photography at this stage in the game. You know, it was uh, unless there was an artistic reason for it, obviously. But uh, yeah, that, that was just the baseline in terms of the product we built. Do you have any stories that stand out to your personal favorites or something that makes a story stand out that maybe isn't part of the, you know, the article or, or a favorite issue as a whole? You know, I, so I, I've been doing this for 16 years, you know, working in, in automotive writing and I had, I don't know if it's common, but I have like writer's amnesia. As soon as I've <laughs> kind of submitted a, a work, I tend to forget I've even written it. So sometimes I go back and look and, um, you know, sometimes it's embarrassing to go back, especially way back to see what you've written. Uh, but um, I, I don't know that I had a, a favorite issue altogether. I mean, there's some covers that, that really came out well uh, that I really, really liked. The last cover actually was phenomenal. You know, I was, I was really happy. That was a, um, you know, really long shot. Uh, the, there's not much of the vehicle featured on, on the cover. Um, but um, man, I'd have to go back. I haven't, I haven't really probed back issues. I, I, I literally have a, a habit of producing it and walking away and just moving on to what's next because there's always so much more to do. I was, I seem to always like the, the fall issues. I think the camel trophy one was one I liked. I wanted to execute it a little differently than we did, but overall, you know, I was happy with, with how that came out. Camel trophy is such an iconic part of, uh, you know, the, the, the brand story. Right. And but it's a tricky one to get right though. It is. It you is. have to do it in a certain way. Otherwise it's just like, yeah, great. Another camel trophy. Yeah. So we were lucky to have, you know, some, some photography from people that were, you know, camel trophy participants that, that shared some of their stuff. Uh, Land Rover shared some deeper, you know, photography than, than what was on their press server. That one conceptually was one of my favorites. You know, the, the second to last issue with, with all the Defender stuff as well. I didn't want to get into the habit of making theme issues, but with, with the new Defender coming out, I thought it was worth kind of reexamining Defender, you know, in its, in its entirety. And we, we hired an illustrator to do some, you know, some fantasy pieces, and, you know, had that model evolved like any other normal vehicle and fill in the blanks. I didn't really get any feedback. I don't know how people felt about that, but it was an exercise that I thought more mentally than visually was worth going through, you know, to understand why there was such a gap between 2020 and, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the seven years prior. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and, and there's parallels to like the Volkswagen Beetle, right? I mean, they, the, the air cooled Beetle died, what, in 79? Um, well, I mean, it went on in South America for <laughs> into the 2000s, right. but, um, but, you know, it, when it came back as an air-cooled car and a, and a totally different concept, um, there, there were similarities there, too. And it's the same thing. There was a vacuum in the in the development gap there. So, uh, I don't know. Those those were a couple I liked. Uh, you know, from a feedback standpoint, I, one of my got was uh, Will Hedrick um, told me that, you know, he gets every Land Rover magazine he can get his hands on from anywhere in the world. And he told me that the interview I had done with uh, the Defender uh, platform engineer was the most insightful one he had ever read. And to me, that meant a lot, partly coming, you know, from Will himself. Uh, and frankly, I, I really liked doing the interviews. I liked um, getting in with the designers, the engineers, the development people um, behind the scenes. You know, obviously we know Jerry, but there were a lot of guys that that don't get as much attention as Jerry that have as much insight into, uh, into the, the newer vehicles. And, uh, I really enjoyed doing that, those. So any, any chance I got to, uh, interview anyone that was, was working on product I, I took, I hope people appreciated them. I, I, I did get good feedback on those. I don't know how much people read versus looked at pictures, but I did get feedback that the, uh, the interviews were well done. Well, so. There's words in your magazine. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. But it's, it's not all warm, ipsum text either. So it's, uh, 
Although I, I don't know, we could probably print Laura Mipson text and, and have, you know, at least half as many people s- still be happy with it just, just the way it was. Well, and thank you for sharing that information also with the podcast and the podcast listeners, because uh, you, you know, does, you would bring that information to us and it was very kind of you to even do pre defender reveal. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was definitely a fun one. You know, that was a weird last, I guess it was just about, it was a year ago, yeah. wasn't it? It was a year ago. A little over a year yeah. ago. It was, yeah, it was, it was July last year. You know, I was brought over and um, the, the opportunity was to see the new Defender pre-production in the design studio. And it was, um, I was obviously thrilled you know, to be invited on that. The, the weird thing was once we got over to the UK and I told everyone where I was going, asked if there were any questions, you know, the PR team said, now no one's supposed to know we're here. I'm like... Everyone knows I'm here. <laughs> I already said something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's right. That that's right. Not you had posted on, I think, Facebook. You're like, hey, I'm off to the UK to go see the new Defender. We're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I I reviewed all the uh, pre-trip material to make sure I hadn't missed, you know, some embargo note about right. you know, even even mentioning that we were there and there was nothing. But uh, so, yeah, I, had, I <laughs> pulled that down once they said, you know, no one's supposed to know we're here. We're just... We're just driving cars at Eastner. Oh, okay. Um, so, just just driving around Eastner. Yeah, that's yeah. no big deal. Well, not in Defenders, unfortunately. We drove a Range Rover Sport with P four hundred package, I believe. So um, I think yeah. driving anything at Eastner would be fun. But yeah, I've done it a few times. It's not a bad trip. I never turned that one down either. But uh, you know, the, so so we're over there, and obviously we you know had uh, unbelievable access to stuff that only a handful of other people have. And, and then we have to not talk about it for uh, six or eight weeks. I forget what the embargo break was. You know, we were there in late July and I think it was what, September, September 10th, wasn't it? It was like, September yeah, 11th yeah, that's right. The reveal came yeah. So it was, it was almost 10 weeks of, uh, you know, keeping it <laughs> under, under my hat. And that was not, that was not fun. My, my fear always, I've, I've never broken embargoes. That's, you know, that's privileged material and I'll, I'll, I'll play by the rules, but um, my fear always is that somebody with less scruples is going to dump it and then, you know, uh, ruin it for the rest of us. So uh, fortunately that didn't happen. They, uh, they kept a pretty tight lid on that. I think the night before the uh, the reveal, one of the Eastern European publications let some stuff out or something, but. Well, they're in a different time zone over there, I guess. Uh, There's a global embargo. We all, (laughs) yeah. So about uh, you know, the trip there, did, they invited you because you were Alloy and Grit, so they're aware of you and, 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 and it kind of included you was a small grouping of people that got to go, right? Exceptionally small. And, and you know, that was a, a privilege for sure uh, to be invited on that. It was our publication, uh, Overland Journal, uh, Matthew Scott uh, for Out, Outside Magazine was invited on that. And Car and Driver had someone there, Kelly Blue Book had someone there, and Angus McKenzie from Motor Trend, who's now in England anyway, uh, was invited to the presentation. He wasn't on the rest of the trip, but he was invited to the presentation. So six outlets um, from North America were were invited on that. So um, yeah, that was a high honor to be included in that group. You didn't get to go to Namibia though, did you? No. So that that was one of the uh, disappointments. we were scheduled to do the UK drive in, uh, Oh, about March. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think it was early April, actually. I think it was April 10th was the, uh, uh scheduled trip. And, uh, we'd only received the invitation. They hadn't even made, um, travel arrangements or anything. And, um, you know, I had already, <laughs> like I said, I had already been at, at Eastner. So I knew kind of this was, you know, the, the, the short lead trip, um, it was not the epic 10 day, uh, Namibia trip, but, um, I don't know how we would have pulled that off anyway. That's a, that's a really long commitment, you know, mm-hmm. uh, to do that. And, um, and they also had to sit on those stories for a long time. So yeah, would have been fun to do, but yeah, I, I still have not driven the new Defender yet, if you can believe that, because of uh, the timing with, uh, you know, right. COVID and the shutdown of the magazine. So, well, it's had to certainly had a, an effect on the world and uh, including Alloy and Grit. Kind of kind of the sad thing about that, though, um, if, if I can be honest, is that we launched the magazine when we did in order to be established in time for uh, the launch of the new Defender, which, of course, got delayed and delayed and delayed. And so the the sad irony is that, you know, just as it's coming to market and we're I, I fully expect there will be 
tons of new people coming to the brand looking for, you know, a, a publication like ours. Um, we're not going to be there because of, uh, a, how long it took and, you know, and, and the COVID situation, you know, kind of spelling the end of the book. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, for years we were hoping that, uh, this would be the month that, uh, you know, they finally get their stuff together and we'll have a launch date. Yeah. No, nah, another year out. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> do you have a sense as to why it took so long? Cause I mean, we've talked, I know we've talked about it, uh, but you know, maybe yeah. upon reflection, is there, you know, was it the was it the DC 100 concept was was uh, panned so so hard that that seemed to yeah I, th- I think the DC 100 really caused them to go back to the books and and get serious about you know what what Defender meant to the brand um, you know in the end the product doesn't look all that much different but I think they got a better understanding uh, in terms of robustness you know what this vehicle needed to be and um, uh, I, I mean I've not talked to anyone about why it took them, you know, 10 years, <laughs> right. to, uh, eight years to, uh, you know, to go from concept to reality. Cause usually when they show concept these days, it's, you know, a couple of years out from production, it looks pretty much, pretty much the same. Yeah. Uh, I, think I, they, I just think they, they got really serious about making sure it was everything it was promising it would be. Well, that, and I think they kept getting distracted by making more Range Rover models. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I mean, they spent a ton of, money on, you know, capital, I mean, uh, and, and capital improvements, right. Uh, engine plants and, uh, the Slovakia plant. Uh, I, I think they needed a several years of really strong growth in there, right. Every year was a record for most of the last few up until, uh, right. uh until 2019. And so I think, you know, it was, it became a logistical problem as well. Like where, where are we going to build these things <laughs> yeah. if we keep building everything else? So, uh, I don't know. I can't really speak to the the reasons for the delays, but uh, it was certainly frustrating. I wish I wish two years earlier, at least, you know, there had been a stronger um, new Defender launch um, for our sake. Well, they certainly executed quickly on the Evoke and on the Disco and Discovery too. Those were quick executions. I don't think those were the same engineering exercise. I, 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 that exactly. That's my point, though. That was that they were they were completely different animals, so to speak. This one, yeah, in some ways, maybe overthought it. Not, I'm not saying that they didn't execute well, but maybe overthought in the sense of, you know, we they want to get it perfect, get everything perfect, and yeah, sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good, as they as uh, as often said, right. (laughs) Yeah. So folks can still, I believe you have uh, a veritable 110, 110 ton. I'm just trying to use some Land Rover number uh, of them, of the magazine still in your garage, I assume. Uh, They are heavy. We have some in a warehouse. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, we have. uh, I'm looking at my uh, local and when I say local inventory, I mean in my office here. Everything except for the third issue. Uh, I believe we sold through all of our third issue. Um, you know, we, uh, we have back issues that, that was always part of the business plan as well was to be able to offer new readers, new people just discovering the magazine an opportunity to backfill. And so we, um, you know, we overproduced by a thousand to 2000 copies per issue for future sales. And so we're, we're still working through that. Uh, the economies of scale usually meant that it didn't cost that much more. Sometimes the per issue cost came down. The bulk of the cost is actually in the in the setup and and the shipping. <laughs> so sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, once uh, you know, once once we knew how many we were going to deliver to subscribers and to Barnes and Noble and all that, um, we usually bumped that number by a thousand to two thousand to uh, to cover new arrivals and future sales. And with the possible exception of issue number three, apparently. Yeah, I think we may have, um, you know, in thinking about it, we, we produced a lot of issue one and two, and we might have pulled back too severely for issue three to uh, to, to account for future revenues. <laughs> so uh, folks can buy back issues from your website, I assume? Yeah, the allyandgrit.com website is still up, and we still have our uh, our store, our Shopify store was, is linked uh, in that page. Uh, you can buy directly from Shopify. Um We've we've marked them all down to uh, to seven fifty delivered uh, to the U S. We're not doing international shipments anymore. Um, the current postal rates and uh, the frequency of lost <laughs> international orders didn't make it worthwhile. I mean, the cost of replacing you know a um, a lost package to England 
you know, is about $19. And so you can, Ouch. yeah, you can really only charge that once. And we weren't fully charging that even, you know, yeah. so, uh, so we just decided to suspend international orders, um, you know, when we, when we pulled the magazine, but uh, North American customers can still get, uh, can still get the back issues at seven fifty dollars um, per copy. Hear that Dixon? You're not foreign. I hear. <laughs> <laughs> We always considered Canada part of North America. Yeah, it was always one market, uh, especially since Land Rover mostly treated it that way. So, as they should, so, yes, as they should. So, so, brothers, so, brothers so it's a North American spec magazine at this point. It was always North America's Land Rover magazine, independent Land Rover magazine. Yeah, that was our that was our tagline from the beginning. So, how many issues total were there? There were twelve. Twelve. So, okay. Yep. So collect them all except for one. Collect them all, yeah. You, so if for, you, if, for 90 bucks minus the one issue you can't get, you could have the whole set. Pretty much, yeah. Yep. And we've still got we've still got people doing that. Um, when I see the orders now, I see orders for, for 10, and they're they're usually minus like the last issue or the um, you know, the previous one. So that tells me someone picked it up at Barnes and Noble, went online and decided they needed to have all the back issues. So the, the final issues was never sold in the store. We got a, um, a letter from Barnes and Noble right as we were going to, or just before we went to print saying that, um, that they were suspending re, uh, receiving shipments of new inventory for the foreseeable future as they were going to be closing down stores. So that one doesn't have a barcode on it. Um, and it was never distributed at retail. So that was a subscriber and um, direct sale only. Interesting Neat. fact. See, there we go. Exclusive to the podcast. Learn That's about. Right. We'll have a link, of course, in the show notes. But it is alloy and grit spelled out. Uh, yes. Uh, dot com is the website, and yes. you can go pick up back issues or all the issues except for one uh, of yep. the magazine. Yeah, I might. I might just have to do that. Pick up a, a full set of of extras, and I can hand them out to people. <laughs> you're welcome to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so you're encouraged, Harold. Encouraged yes. to do that. You yes. should have ten cents for everybody. I'm, I'm sure you're not going to discourage me in that. No, no, we'll, we'll be uh, we'll have those available through uh, basically through November, and then uh, you know the, the last month of the year we're going to wind wind down the business entity as well, since mm. uh, you know since we're going to not be producing anymore, just to avoid one more tax year. So. Um, We'll, we'll suspend sales uh, after November and, uh, and we'll see what happens. You know, there's a, there's a possibility we may make a deal with, uh, with Overland Journal to, um, you know, to actually continue selling back issues um, mm. on some, some arrangement or, uh, or not. I mean, we haven't made any, any arrangements yet, but we're looking into options depending on what our inventory levels are like at that point. So what are your future plans? Do you have any future plans for, for this or is it uh, just, you're waiting and seeing uh, for, for alloy and grit, yeah, or something related to you know land. You know, aside from joining joining the podcast, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which we thank you. Um, no, I think alloy and grit's going to go on ice for now. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, there were multiple partners in that, and if yeah. um, none of us are going to go forward with it uh, together, then no one's kind of going to go forward gotcha. with it individually. That said, you know, I think we'll all continue to do projects in the Land Rover space. Um, you know, Chris, Chris is already, he, he was asking me this week about an, an article. He's, he's, um, you know, going to be publishing with, with one or two magazines. That's a little uncertain at this point, but, uh, on a West Virginia trip he did in his series too. I know, you know, Dan will continue to do stuff in the Land Rover community as will Steve. Um, I may, I'm looking at maybe converting some of the, um, the series guide material, uh, that I did into a uh, longer form, uh, printed material books, uh, you know, kind of buyer's guides maybe for, uh, for North American customers since no one in North America seems to make books for, uh, for Land Rover owners. Everything comes out of the UK as well. So that's a good idea. Um, yeah. we'll see, uh, those are time consuming, but I have, you know, I've done a lot of the research already. So it's, it's a matter of extrapolating into a longer format. Are you getting out of the automotive news publishing world or? Long-term, I'd like to come back into publishing full-time. You know, right now I have my, my uh, daytime job in marketing uh, that keeps me really busy. But uh, um, I recently started doing a podcast with a friend of mine. Um, and this was one of the, the projects I kind of had in my back pocket, uh, hoping to execute uh, earlier, uh, called Vintage Euro. Um, I've I really came out of European cars more than, than, you know, Land Rovers exclusively. 
So Vintageiro is is kind of uh, aimed at post World War II up to about 25 years old. Basically, anything that falls under the personal import uh, kind of restriction. You know, we're doing that as a podcast now, and hope to maybe evolve that into a magazine at some point. Um, are you are you German centric or Italian? German Eng- German English French Italian and Swedish. You'll do, so you'll do yeah, it all. A little bit of everything. Yeah. So please yeah. spell that so we can ha- and put it in the show notes. So because so yes, it's it's Vintageuro with one e v i n t a g e u r o dot com. Vintage U R O. Yes, exactly. Because that's the URL I could get. I couldn't get Vintageuro with two e's. Somebody else is squatting on that one. Now your way is easier to spell. Yeah, it's efficient too. I was a subscriber to uh, Hemmings Sports and Exotics, which uh, closed down, I think, in 2017, 2016. And they covered a lot of my dad's era sports cars, you know, a lot of immediate post war kind of MGs and triumphs and things like that. But the market has moved on, and um, there's a strong demand in the 80s and 90s, kind of up and coming classics. you know, Volkswagen GTIs, BMW M3s, um, you know, Mercedes uh, of all variety, AMG stuff, um, as well as, you know, Ferrari 308s and uh, Lancias and Alfa Romeos. Uh, you know, we I worked at a dealership uh, that, that actually sold Alfa Romeo in the last uh, year uh, of its existence. And oh, so, my. I have a, I have a strong connection to those cars. You know, I'm, I'll be 50 next month. So I grew up, you know, seventies, eighties, nineties stuff. Um, and, um, and I didn't, I don't really see anybody serving that market exclusively. I mean, I think, uh, uh, grassroots motorsports does a, a good job of covering elements of that. Yeah. You know, mostly from an amateur motorsport perspective, uh, a DIY kind of thing. Uh, I don't see anyone really covering it the way that, that I'd like to do it. So, um, so that may evolve into a print publication and um, I've got another offshoot um, similarly. It's not as much my interest, but no one's covering it uh, in the vintage Japanese car space. Uh, those are starting to become genuinely kind of sought after now, especially original uh, early, you know, Mazdas, Toyotas, Nissans. Uh, especially, like- if, especially if they're JDM. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm not talking, yeah, definitely not talking about the, you know, the, the tuned out uh, later cars, but really the early pioneers in, in the Japanese car space. So uh, I won't say what that one will be called because I still need to buy the URL, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but that would be a, a logical offshoot of that as well, because there's uh, you know, it's a younger market that's starting, starting to come into collecting those cars and appreciating them for what they are. So that's where I'm hoping to go. Certainly, Vintageiro leaves a lot of room for me to incorporate Land Rover stuff, and uh, that'll certainly be part of the plan. That may be, I don't know that that'll be a replacement for Alloy and Grit, obviously, but... Um, it's an out, it's an outlet for you. Yeah, it's definitely an outlet for yeah. me. So. As is the podcast, you can, you know, join join us yeah. in the podcast and contribute Anytime. as you uh, as you, as you see fit or something interesting <laughs> happens, you know. I can't promise I'll be on any... Uh, any uh, private trips uh, anytime soon, given my uh, lack of stature now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm just a nobody like everybody else now. Well, Brian, thanks very much for giving us the update on the end of production of Alloy yes. Grit and re- remind people of what they can do to get the back issues, where to go uh, for for that. Yeah, so I would say uh, go to alloyandgrit.com and click on the store link. Our current inventory will be available on the Alloy and Grit website, but there's also a link to the full Shopify store, which is sometimes an easier experience, uh, especially if you're ordering multiples. Um, one of the limitations of the, the shopping cart inside the website is I think uh, it's complicated to, to put multiple things in the cart for some reason. You have to keep going back. Uh, so the Shopify and we, and we is, want to encourage multiple items. In that yeah. Way. The Shopify because, experience because your wife sure. wants her garage back. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, we'll be uh, offering those at seven fifty a copy from here on out. Well, from now now until December first, till the end of November. Yeah, till the end of November. And, and the holidays are coming. This is a good gift idea. A full yeah. set of alloy and grit. It would make a great gift for somebody. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I'll have to take inventory next time I come on. I'll. Uh, 
I'll have to pimp the uh, the wooden boxes a little bit because that was. Uh, I was, was going to say if you could put put together a box set and have that as a line item on your on your store, that might. Uh, be- there's there. So we we um, I produce a solid oak uh, keepsake box. Uh, it was something I designed with my dad, and uh, and we we spent a Thanksgiving a couple years ago sawing up uh, solid oak ends and plywood oak uh, inners. It is very nice. I'm looking at it right now. $40 for the Alloy and Grit magazine storage box. Yeah. So well, uh, Yeah, but do you have a line item for the magazines to fill it? Series one. So what we were doing was series one, series two, and, and the idea was series three. Uh, series two is still technically available, I believe. Series one is not because of the uh, uh, the lack of issue number three. The box right now, the box is available uh, separately. Uh, what we had done was mark them with series one or series two when they were purchased that way. So right now they're uh, they're just marked with the alloy and grit uh, word mark. Yeah, I mean we can still we can still put together a series one marking or a series two marking. So yeah, if people want to want to do that as a keepsake those are still available in in very limited quantities and i don't i'm not kidding about that you're not making you and your dad are not not making more of those no no we cut up a whole lot of oak and brought a whole lot of oak sawdust into the house which which we both heard about Um, (laughs) so sawdust and magazines now taking up the house need to get them get that cleared out and and uh, the dirty little secret is that um probably a third of what i put together doesn't meet my uh, requirements for, for sending it out the door. So they warp a little bit, you know, as, as the the lumber ages and sometimes I mismark them. I mean, they're literally hand marked. So, um, I've, I've got some double, double marked ones, uh, that I've given friends or whatever, you know, the, where the, where the ink pad jumped or whatever. Well, you just need that little label, like they put on leather jackets, you know, there are little flaws that add to its character, which in a hand-built product. Well, I'll, I'll let the inconsistency in the, in the ink run, be a, an acceptable flaw, but a double or triple mark because I, I sneeze during the mark or whatever <laughs> <laughs> Does, doesn't make the cut. Um, some of them don't square up real well either. Um, oak's a really tough material to make a small piece with. So, And the $40 includes postage uh, in the U.S.? It, and I, it's, it, just, it includes U.S. shipping, yeah. Uh, what about to Canada? Will you send those to Canada? Yeah, I think they're... Uh, <laughs> Hey, have to ask. I think shipping to Canada is like fifteen bucks or something like that because it's a it has to go out as a as a parcel. Well, thanks again, Brian. We will, as we typically do, we close three times before we finally are done. So, uh, we'll, of course, I think this is. I do the same. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> the way things go. You always think of something else at the last minute. Thanks again. Welcome to the show. Sorry about alloy and grit. Yes, absolutely. Well, thanks again for having me on. It's it's always a pleasure. This has been show number 89. We hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank today David Short for joining us, talking about Oxford in America and its current journeys. I hope, we hope he makes it. <laughs> yeah, give him, you know, follow his journey. Ooh, do we, I, I hope all goes well. You may have noticed I'm a little concerned about the timing for him. So hopefully that'll go well. He's, gonna, he's asking a lot of his schedule, that's for sure. Thank you. You said that very nicely, Harold. Yes, you said it much better. He's asking a lot of the schedule and of Oxford, I think. Well, yeah, I wasn't going to say he's asking a lot of Oxford, but he's certainly asking a lot of the calendar. And thanks to Brian Joslin. Uh, thanks again, Brian, for joining the podcast. And uh, sorry about Alloy and Grit, which we just talked about. No problem at all. Yeah, there you go. Don't forget to go out to Alloy and Grit and get your back issues. And there's a small number of the vintage box sets handmade. That's right. By uh, Brian and his father that you can include with your your magazines and protect them. You cut them, I build them. And once they're gone, they're gone because the trees haven't sure. grown back in the backyard yet. That's right. And as always, thanks to the One True Packs for his continued production support. Uh, we had a little problem last month with the podcast with the uh, Minnesota folks. Uh, that was not Pax's fault. That was mine because I was I had to rearrange and delete some things and I got things out of order and then we fixed it. Make sure you have the newest updated version of last month's podcast with the Minnesota Club. How would one do that if one was using a player? Uh, was there a refresh button or something you'd hit? To get you mean the on a podcast one? app or do you mean out on the website, our website? Uh, well, on the website, it should be current, I would correct. assume. So. Yes, right. That is correct. And I assume with the podcast applications, um, you might have to refresh or maybe delete the current one you have and then re-download it just to make sure you have the right one. That's probably the okay. way to do that. Because uh, I it was a... 
I don't know, a week or two after the show came out that I, I pushed the new one out. So most people. So one got could the, look at maybe the date on the file or something and figure uh, out. Yeah. I'm not, that's a good maybe. question, Harold. I th- uh, file size actually, cause it, it ended up being a little shorter. I guess when in doubt, if it doesn't sound like it's, if it sounds like it's in a, in a weird order, then maybe you need to get the newest version and try again. Yeah. If you're, if it, it's in the middle of the, at the beginning, middle of the Minnesota podcast, and uh, we were talking to Dave from the, from the Minnesota club, he'll say something. And then Harold, I think in particular, you'll respond like two, a half a second before you should. That's because things uh, got there's s- some s- audio uh, overlap of some sort. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Because I had four tracks to edit instead of two. We are part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out the other 4x4 related shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. Visit our website, centersteer.com. That's in the British spelling, C-E-N-T-R-E, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories we discussed in today's show or podcasts, other podcasts linked in today's show, such as Brian's Vintage Euro (laughs) podcast. If you're not a subscriber, uh, please do so to get the show automatically. Uh, Hopefully it's the right version of the show, right? Uh, You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, and now through voicemail. You can directly support the show at uh, patreon.com slash center steer. You can buy us a t-shirt. You can buy us a tee. You can buy us a sticker. Well, buy yourself a t-shirt. Buy yourself a sticker. Buy us a tee. Click on store on the top of the menu of our webpage for all those details. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Don't forget to check on voicemail on the website and let us know what you think of the show or what you think they should do with the Disco 5. Should the Disco 5 go away? Yeah, yay or nay. Uh, The next three voicemails will receive a Center Steer t-shirt. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. You may now resume your important things. assuming we get out of 2020 first.